Good evening, and welcome to the April 8, 2024 work session of the Mayor and Council. Tonight is, uh, there's one topic for discussion, and that is the FY 2025 proposed operating and capital budgets for the city of Gaithersburg. Um, this is the one meeting, one of the few meetings where um, I will call for any testimonies before we get into this, because once we get into this, it's sort of like got its own momentum. So um, if there's anybody who'd like to speak on the topic of the budget, um, we ask that you, this will, be, this will be the time we ask that you state your name um, and address or neighborhood for the record. Um, keep your comments in no more than three minutes. If you have more than three minutes worth of material to deliver, by all means, use your three minutes and then send us the rest in writing. It'll be considered just the same. Um, do we have anybody who'd like to testify this evening? Mostly staff over here. You guys are going to get a chance to testify in a different way. Um, okay, let me check on Zoom. Um, if there's anybody on Zoom who'd like to testify, please use the raise hand function and I will call on you. Not seeing that happen. Okay. Um, well, then we will jump right into it, and I'm going to hand it over to our city manager, Tanisha Briley. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Ashman, members of the city council, and you know, all of the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Gaithersburg residents that are watching us online. Welcome to the fiscal year 2025 budget workshop. Last week, during the public hearing, we gave a brief presentation covering a demo of the new online budget book, an overview of, budget, of the budget development process, and a high-level summary of proposed revenues and expenses um, for the general fund. Tonight, we're gonna take a closer look at revenue and expenses, including a department-by-department department summary of significant changes and highlights in the proposed budget impact on the next five years. We'll then cover the FY25 proposed stormwater fund and capital improvement program. Dennis will cover that. We look forward to answering your questions throughout the workshop. Assisting with tonight's presentation again is Finance Director Janice Hartman and Deputy City Manager Dennis Enslinger will present later. All departments are also represented this evening to address any specific questions that you might have about departmental budgets. All right, excellent. Excellent. Welcome, everybody. Oh, I guess I, oh, there we go. Covered that one already. Here we go. We're jumping into revenue. So we'll start with a look at total revenue. This chart is showing the history of total general fund revenue with actuals from 2019 fiscal year to 2023. Uh, also, projections for this current fiscal year, which is 2024, and then what we have proposed for next year, 2025. A few things that I want to point out. Since we're looking at total revenue, reappropriated funds from the reserve have been included. You can see this in FY19 actuals, uh, the three million that's at the top. Uh, and you can see projected amounts for FY24 and 25. So that's the dark pink, red striped portion at the top of the solid bar that represents the amount of the reappropriation. These amounts fluctuate for different reasons. Um, in the fiscal year 2019, the majority of the reappropriation um, was about 2.1 million that was an additional transfer to our other post-employment benefits fund or OPEB in that year. So that's the majority of, of that uh, reappropriation amount. The planned amount for FY24 includes a projected $7 million in reappropriation. The original budget adopted for FY24 included actually 10.8 million in reappropriation. So that amount has since been reduced down though we expect some fluctuation between now and the end of fiscal year. Um, the amount was really to fund a larger than normal transfer to our capital improvements and asset replacement funds for future investment. Given current trends in revenue and expenditures, we now project uh, a need for only about $7.2 million. And as I said, the final amount will some be somewhere between seven point two million and what was approved in the original budget based on how things shake out at the end of the year. So taking a look at the solid bars, um, 
the solid portion of each of the bars, which is the sort of green turquoise portion, you can see a few things. The city has experienced modest yet consistent revenue growth until um, FY22 before it levels off, as you see in FY23 and going forward. However, revenues in FY21, 22, and 23 included over 11 million in American Rescue Plan Act support, or ARPA, as well as other pandemic funding support from Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, also known as the CARES Act. FY22 also included a significant amount of one-time non-recurring revenues like a $4 million transfer from the stormwater fund to repay the initial investment needed um, when the stormwater fund was created, and an unanticipated permit revenue from large projects like the Carnegie at Washingtonian Center which came in sooner than planned. The last bar focusing only on the solid green portion illustrates that we are projecting 81 million in revenue for next year's budget, or about 2 million more than we are projecting for the current year. FY25 does not include any ARPA funding or other pandemic funding support. So what's significant about this statement is um, this shows our recovery from the pandemic, that we're able to see growth in the revenue, stability in the revenue without a significant dependence on one-time uh, pandemic support revenues. So let's revisit a chart from last week, which by the way, our very excellent finance director caught a mistake in last week's chart, so it's been corrected. Uh, with the reappropriation amount showing that 7% as it should. Um, so revisiting this chart, we're just looking at a breakdown of the revenues uh, by category of revenue. So of course, within each of these categories, there are lots and lots of line items, which I'm sure you saw on the online budget book, so you can drill down. And we'll do a little bit of that, um, looking at the major sources of funding for each of the categories Tanisha, in just a few minutes. Yeah. For the benefit of the public, do you want to define reappropriation? Uh, yes. So I, I refer to it lots of different ways. It's essentially a transfer from the city's reserve or um, fund balance, as it's sometimes called. Um, I think at the state level, they might call it a rainy day fund. It's not necessarily that way for us because we do use it um, more as a savings for large investments that we're going to make in the future. Um, so I will talk a little bit more about that, but thank you. For, thank you. For that. So the percentages that you see here on this chart closely track the trends we typically see in our revenue sources, uh, particularly in our major revenue categories, which is real estate taxes and income taxes, which are shown here as local taxes and county grants and shared taxes making up the vast majority of our revenue at 69%, for those two large uh, pie slices that are at the bottom right part of the slide. Then the slices start to get smaller as you move around the pie. Uh, though those revenue sources are no less important to us, they're not necessarily major revenue sources as our bread and butter really, really comes from property tax and income tax. As I also noted last week, the use of one-time money from the reserve, which is the reappropriation, um, the use of that to fund capital investments is required for us since we are a debt-free community, which means we will experience fluctuations in this amount on an annual basis as we save for large projects over time and then we spend the money to execute the, those projects when they're ready. So we are not proposing to use any of these reappropriated dollars to fund uh, operating expenses or any of our day-to-day -day operations. And this marks the fourth straight year of not budgeting for reappropriations for operations only for capital investments. Next, we will take a closer look at some of these revenue categories, starting first with the big two that I've already outlined. So major revenue sources, again, we have, there are 10 categories that were just on the previous slide, 10 revenue categories, and those categories are all made up of subcategories. 
this can all, this will account for a slight difference in the percentages. So if you're trying to compare percentages from the previous slide to this one, it'll be a little bit different. So for example, local taxes was 44% on the previous slide. That includes this line item real estate taxes, but also several other categories. I'm only going to focus on the largest of, of each category for tonight's purposes. So the real, real estate taxes is expected to generate about $33.6 million next year, which is about 38%, accounts for 38% of total projected revenue. This is an increase of 5% over the current year. With the triennial reassessment process, staff reviewed the newly assessed values, which are capped at an increase of 10% per property for each of the next three years to estimate what our taxable base value is. We also included a discount rate to account for estimated adjustments as a result of anticipated uh, appeals. So we initially included about 900,000 of discount to that amount in anticipation of, of these appeals. We recently received a list from SDAT which details the properties that have appealed their values. The full amount of potential reduction in real estate tax revenue to the city based on this list would be about $2.2 million. However, it's unlikely that all of the appeals will result in a negative adjustment to their assessed value, but we do expect to see more than what would be typical given the current challenges in the commercial real estate space, Anthony, particularly with office buildings. On the appeals, the, the <laughs> number of appeals are filed, that's fixed now, right? The, you have a window. I believe five. there's a window or I believe it, so, but I yeah we I mean we received a list I believe yeah. that's a complete list of okay. all the appeals that have been filed thanks and council members please jump in with questions at, at any point this is one of those meetings <laughs> it just is jump yeah, in with you yeah. <laughs> um so you know us trying to anticipate what those appeals are we uh, factored in a discount of about 900,000, but we don't think all the appeals of the potential 2.2 will be um, successful. Now that we have the list, uh, Janice was able to do some additional analysis, and we think that we can reevaluate whether the 900,000 is still a valid discount. We may um, increase or sort of decrease the discount from 900,000 to 700,000. Uh, based on the list. So we'll, we'll continue to do a little more work on that before we make a final decision there, but that'll increase what you're seeing for projected revenue in this category by about 200,000. Income tax, which is a subcategory of the county grants and shared taxes revenue category, is expected to generate about 17 million. Income tax revenue consists of the city's share of income taxes received by the state of Maryland from returns filed by residents of Gaithersburg. So the city does not have a separate income tax rate, but receives 17% of collected county income taxes. Montgomery County's income tax rate is 3.2%. We have essentially left this amount flat for next year, as you'll see in the, in the next slide on the graph. Uh, as the current year actuals are trending slightly lower than what was budgeted in this current year, um, so we'll continue to keep an eye on that, but it looks like uh, income tax is starting to level out a bit, though we do ex anticipate some increase in the future, which Janice will cover. T Tanisha, do we understand the reasoning for that? For the leveling out? Yes. No, we do not. Do you? I mean, I think that our unemployment rate is, is low. You know, we all the indicators that influence income tax seem to be strong, but Janice, do you want to add? Yeah, I think has to do with a lot of the estimated tax payments that, that were being made up front and the, like the subcontractor payments and that seems to have gone down so it seems like some of those estimated payments aren't coming in as early and the, the, the analysis that we get from the state which I can go back and, <coughs> and provide some additional information but it, it does seem like it's it, it really increased it's not so it's not like it's going down it's just it had increased significantly over the past couple of years um, yeah, I, share, I can just economy. jump to this slide quickly and, and you can see here the income tax charts on the bottom. Um, you know, we've seen anything from 1 to 9% increases year over year in income tax. Uh, and then you sort of see a, a little bit of leveling out. 
we only have our quarterly uh, payments to go off of and then the previous year's information. So um, I think for now we felt comfortable leaving it flat given where we saw numbers going in this current year. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. A quick follow-up, sorry, on the previous one. So real estate taxes generally are remitted September and December, and then maybe a sprinkle throughout the year for people who are paying uh, late. When you get your remittance in October, let's say, how closely do they tie to the December uh, numbers typically in the past? And then does that give you an opportunity? Like, so if you budget it, you know, X amount, and it comes way ahead of that, can we expect December to mirror that, or there's still flexibility? Or if it comes way below it, do you readjust, or what happens? So October is this the significant payment where we get, I would say, 90%. It, it's the largest chunk. And then, so what we get in December is a much smaller piece of that. Okay. So normally by October, we have a good idea of what's been billed and what, what, we're, what we can expect for the rest of the year. So it's just a matter of collecting those payments then and any delinquencies that might happen. But by October, when we get those payments, we, we see what's been billed and what we can expect to okay. see. So uh, these two categories combined com uh, account for $51 million of our $87 million budget. So you can see why these are our two sort of bread and butter major sources of revenue. I did have a, a slide that we went through last year on the property tax rate. I like this slide. I think it's helpful for the public as well. Just to kind of understand a couple things. One, um, our property tax rate has not been increased and uh, only once in the last 60 years has it been increased. We continue to have the lowest property tax rate in the state among the top 10. I looked at the top 10 populated mm -hmm. municipalities in the state and we have the lowest. Um, and the property is broken into two categories, so real and personal. The city's real property tax rate is 26 and 2 tenths cents per $100 of assessed value. And the personal property tax rate is 53 cents per $100 of assessed value. Um, personal property rate is levied on tangible personal property. So basically things that can be felt or touched, um, physically relocated. And that is except for manufacturing equipment, manufacturing inventory, and commercial inventory. But as you can see, those are not great sources of revenue for us. The vast majority of our real estate tax comes from uh, residential property, residential and commercial. Just property. to clarify for the public, Tanisha, that's personal property for businesses, not for individuals. That's correct. So there's a corporate personal property tax and then a personal property tax. And, and that would be related to like single member, LL, just single, like sole proprietors, mm -hmm. if you run a business or sell. Right. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I think we covered. Real estate, let me see if there was anything else here to show. So the next set of charts, the charts that you'll see in this category, you're, you're seeing seven years, right? So you have uh, four years, I'm sorry, five years of actuals, the projection for this current fiscal year, 24, and then what we have proposed for the next year. So you can see just visually, right, this, um, I think, modest, steady growth. Um, that we've been able to rely on to fund the majority of our core service delivery um, in the city. As I said before, um, on the income side, the factors that significantly influence growth in income tax revenues are increased population. So we might see those numbers shift as Lake Forest comes online and other projects uh, come online in the city that increases our revenue, uh, our resident base and increased wages and low unemployment among residents, which we know that we enjoy in this region. So that creates some stability in those two sources for us. All right, so we'll take a look at um, nine other key revenue sources and, and I define key revenue by uh, revenue categories that generate more than 900,000 or so uh, per year for us. So we'll quickly review those. If you see an asterisk next to a category, it's because I've uh, sort of dubbed it a pandemic impacted category. And this is actually gonna be the last year that I show you the pandemic impacted revenue chart because I think we finally reached the point where 
we have surpassed pre-pandemic uh, levels in those categories. So that's, that's really good news as well. So under the charges for service category, there are two that stand out. Parks, Recreation, and Culture programs, which of course was impacted significantly by the pandemic. Um, it represents 4% of all revenue. Recycling collection is 2%. Um, the recycling fee was increased last year, as you might recall. Um, and so we've seen a, a slight increase in revenue there, and we've seen that level off and expected to level uh, as long as we keep that rate in place. Um, on the parks, recreation, and culture side, those fees are expected to generate about $3.7 million next year, which is, which is a 4.5% increase over um, the current year's budget. So we continue to see steady progress and recovery there. And in, in, in fact, we expect it to surpass pre-pandemic levels uh, for next year. Under county grants and shared taxes, I'm gonna go into this a little bit more on the next slide, but we're expecting a, well, my phone just jumped off the chair. So <laughs> we're expecting about $5 million uh, in what's called duplication services monies from Montgomery County. So I'll talk more about that. And then a key uh, source of revenue under fines and forfeitures is the photo radar, radar fines, which makes up about 2% of the budget. That's one that we actually want to see go down, uh, and, and there's some trend there uh, that supports that. Okay, so here's the charts. Recycling collections at the top shows the leveling off that I just talked about after the fee increase that was implemented for this current fiscal year. It was a modest increase really to cover contractual increases from our vendor um, over time. As we know, uh, we actually absorbed some of those increases over the last several years and then we built in a modest uh, fee increase there to cover that over time. Um, duplication services, it's in the center chart. That's one with the dotted lines. It's showing the growth in this revenue category that was driven mainly by the addition of police services to the services that are recognized by Montgomery County as duplicate services by municipalities. This means that the county would ultimately be responsible for providing these services if the city did not do so. And since our residents pay taxes to both the city and the county, the county pays us an approximation <coughs> of what they calculate their costs would be if they delivered the service in Gaithersburg. We receive funds for some transportation costs and now police costs as a result of legislation passed by the county in 2022. As a result of adding the police services in 2022, the amount we receive has gone from about 1 million or 1 and a half million to the estimated almost 5 million for next year. The primary driver of this change is the addition of payment for six more police officer positions that the county added mid-year uh, this year to attempt to compensate us for the officers that they have redeployed from our city to other parts of the county that are experiencing higher crime rates. This shift in service model where Gaithersburg will now be responsible for all calls for service where before we uh, had concurrent uh, responsibility where the county or the city would respond based on who was available. Um, this required us to hire an additional, additional police officers to ensure adequate coverage. Um, we are actually adding eight officers, which we'll cover a little bit later, to deal with the approximately 4,200 more calls for service per year um, and the county funding is gonna cover a portion of six officers. The other reason this revenue category is increasing is because the payments for police services was phased in over three years. And so FY25 will be the third year of that phase in, the third and final year. So we're at 100% of what was initially uh, projected. As an aside, we do have some questions about the calculations that the county uses to determine the payment amounts to us. And Mayor Ashman will be presenting testimony on behalf of the city tomorrow to this effect at their upcoming budget hearing. So thank you, Mayor Ashman. Hopefully we get some answers soon. Um, the last chart at the bottom again is showing the photo, I can't say the photo radar fines. This is a category that we would like to see decline as it means that drivers are behaving more safely in the city. 
You can see the trend here reflects that. However, I do want to point out that the projected uh, FY24 amount of 1.4 includes, we think, both safer <coughs> driver behavior, but also a glitch in the citation process that um, meant that we lost out on some revenue in this current fiscal year. That's been addressed, uh, and so we are expecting to realize $1.7 million in next year. I have a question on the recycling. Yeah. How does the revenue compare to what it costs us to provide the service? Are Does it cover even? the full? It certainly covers the contract, yes. It, it covers the contract, all of the direct expenses associated with the recycling and some of the overhead associated with it as well, as far as the manpower needed to. Okay, so this that. is a break even. It's not a profit center. For it's us. not a profit It's not quite break even either, I would say, if you're right. allocating all of the man hours and overhead to it, but it's covering the direct cost for okay. sure with the overhead. And Tanisha, for the uh, the radar fines, uh, because we think we lost out this year because of the glitch, that's why we're projecting the same as 23 versus the trend of, of decreasing? Yeah, we, we think so. I mean, obviously, I think there are, we are seeing citations overall trending down as they should be as, as drivers, you know, observe safer practices. but. Um, the majority of that decline, I think, is related to that issue. Okay. The, um, does the city operate its own collection and remitting? I know we have the cameras, or is that done with the county or the state? It's contracted out, and we use the same vendor. That is okay. 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 All great questions. Thank you. Continuing to work our way through some key revenue sources, highway user revenue. Um, we'll cover cover some detail on that. We had a little bit of scare earlier in the uh, legislative session. Um, highway user revenue is about 3% of total revenue, so it's uh, not insignificant for sure. Uh, under licenses and permits, the big drivers there are building permits and the rental housing license. Um, rental housing license is actually a little bit cyclical if you've looked at the budget book and sort of compared year over year, um, and that's due to the billing cycle that we use. There's a three-year... It's a, so, biennial. So, bi biennial, right. Yeah, so there's much. more properties one year that renew versus So it, it, it goes up and down a little bit, but it's in a way that we're able to predict and project, so we don't consider when we have an increase in one year that that's one-time revenue. It's actually expected to be up higher one year and then it goes down a little bit the next under local taxes again this was the same category shared by real estate taxes so in that category is also hotel motel tax which has an asterisk uh, meaning it was uh, impacted significantly by the pandemic and the admissions and amusement tax um, those to combine make up three percent of total revenue so let's take a peek at the charts uh, state highway user revenue. Um, so this is revenue that we receive. It's shared revenue from the state's gasoline and motor vehicle revenue account to local governments. Initial action at the state level was going to result in a significant cut to these funds as the state looked for ways to close its own budget gap. Due to a one-time transfer authorized by Governor Moore following extensive lobbying by communities across the state and Maryland Municipal League, the HUR was restored, um, resulting in a modest increase in funding for next fiscal year. So transportation funding continues to be a challenging issue for the General Assembly to resolve, so we will need to continue to keep a close watch on what happens with it. Um, the bottom chart is showing building permits, and this is one that uh, always helps me drive home the point of, of one-time revenue and how that works sometimes. Uh, typically, we expect to get a, between uh, one and a half and two million per year uh, in a typical year, uh, but this is all dependent on development, right? And when projects come forward, and even with our best projections, um, sometimes projects move forward faster than we thought they would, as was the case with the Carnegie um, at Washingtonian. Um, that came in in a year we hadn't predicted. We thought it was actually gonna be the next fiscal year. 
um, or projects stall for a variety of reasons that are sort of beyond the city's control. Um, so we work closely with staff to planning staff, planning and code staff to kind of understand where these projects are in the cycle and do our best to account for them in the fiscal year that we expect them to be building, which means that they pull the permit. Um, but that can shift at any time, which always makes us, I think rightfully so, gun shy on um, including some of those revenues in a, in a fiscal year. It, when we do and we feel good about accounting for them, we're also still very careful about distinguishing between what's being driven by this one particular or several projects uh, and what we can continue to count on on an annual basis so that we don't pair ongoing expenses with these one-time fluctuations based on development. Okay, so this slide is showing the pandemic impacted revenues last year for this slide. So this is the V slide. Um, the dotted, or sorry, the dashed line at the top that's uh, purple is parks, recreation, and culture programs and events revenue. Um, the turquoise solid line is hotel and motel tax. And then the dotted line at the bottom is admissions and amusement tax. So if you look at the right of the chart, you can see that we have actually, in some cases, recovered to pre-pandemic levels. And in other cases, um, as is the case with hotel motel tax, it looks like we're actually going to be exceeding uh, pre-pandemic levels based on our projection. So this is all really good news uh, for those uh, revenue sources that were deeply impacted. We also are very grateful uh, for the revenue that we got help with through the ARPA Act, as we talked about before, which helped us um, sort of deal with this and uh, continue to fund our services and in fact we were able to unfreeze several positions and fund those positions where we didn't have the resources to do it and now that we appear to be recovered um, and don't need those resources any longer we are seeing that we're able to cover those expenses into the future so those are all very positive uh, positive things but this one gives you a really good visual of the drop I think the um, for parks rec and culture again we're looking at I think it was 3.5 or 3.7 million next year proposed. Uh, and in FY21, it was 1.3 million. And that was really through hard work of the staff being creative with some virtual programs and other ways to try and generate uh, revenue. And it was a little bit of a partial year uh, before the complete shutdown. So um, we've been through some things and we've come through the other side. And uh, it's really good news. Okay. So we're going to shift now to talk about the expense side of the ledger. Um, I'll, this will be the rest of our time together before I turn things over to Janice and then Dennis to close out the workshop. Again, proposed total budget for the general fund is $87 million. Um, that's an increase of 1.3% over the current budget year. It includes six million of reappropriation, no proposed property tax increase. It's aligned with our priorities, but most importantly, it invests in our people um, who provide the and provides them the resources to maintain our current levels of service to the Gaithersburg community. That may seem like a small feat, but given the slide we just went through, it, it's uh, we're we're pretty proud of that. Um, so let's jump in a little bit. The, the pie chart you saw last week, but I just want to point out a few things here. Um, so since we'll review each department's budget, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this slide, but I want to uh, show you that this chart illustrates one, personnel services. So this is all of the costs related to the people, and we are a people-heavy uh, business, is going increasing $2.1 million. Um, this covers the general wage increase and other benefits. As we prepared this uh, proposed budget, we were still awaiting some final numbers that impact the overall uh, increase here, including our health insurance renewal rate, the county's decision on the minimum wage for next year, 
Um, we also do um, some end of year uh, adjustments to, for city staff because we, we have an awesome HR department that's constantly looking at our salaries to be sure that we are um, staying in line with our compensation, um, our compensation philosophy. And so there are some employees that will receive an increase uh, to bring them into either uh, address an internal equity issue or a parity issue or a market issue. Um, and so that also uh, will drive that number up a bit. Uh, we will, of course, share any uh, changes that we make between now and the adopted budget uh, with you before you actually take action on the adopted budget. The largest of this uh, change will, will more than likely be uh, the health insurance renewal rate. Um, literally, th this afternoon, we received an email from our, our uh, cooperative of what that renewal is going to be. It is much larger than we thought it would be. Um, I think across the country, insurance is up for everyone and we did expect an, an increase and had factored in an increase that we actually thought was conservative and, and likely overstated. Um, it turns out that it was well short. So we factored in 8%, um, which in previous years would have, would have made perfect sense. I think our increases have gone from between four and seven percent at the highest um, over the last maybe six or ten years, and we they told us it's going to be fourteen point nine percent. Oh my goodness! Wow. Is um, any of that increase peculiar to the city, or is it just a market trend? It's a bit of a market trend. Uh, we we actually, uh, given where we are in our budget process, they rushed this number to us. Typically, we would have had this number least six or eight weeks ago um, there's a stop loss carrier that's associated with this this may be boring for most of you all but stop loss is basically uh, additional insurance that you layer on top of your insurance in case you have some really large catastrophic claim um, we're in a cooperative and so I think the time frame uh, they got notified from the current stop loss carrier at an odd time that they weren't going to continue with the cooperative so they had to go out bid negotiate and get that all figured out which delayed the process significantly so we didn't get this number until now um, so she sent us the number without the benefit of the meeting which we will be having on monday where we can kind of dig in but we did uh, have a claims review uh, a few months ago that didn't demonstrate any you know outstanding trends that would have influenced uh, from a claims perspective, from an experience perspective. So I'm wondering how much of its market trend, we're going to do our best to understand the number, see where the number might change, though that's likely, unlikely. Um, the good news is that the way we budget for our health insurance, the impact um, isn't, uh, the financial impact of this increase won't be as much as I anticipated it would be so I was thinking it was in the half million dollar range that we were going to need to find um, it's about half of that maybe um, which we can cover as you heard me say earlier there's a few tweaks we're already making with real estate tax for example where we think we can lower the discount rate from 900,000 to 200,000 which will help cover some of that so still so just buy 200 by sorry <laughs> would be great <laughs> yeah, right. I know. Jan's gonna make sure I say that correctly from 900,000 to 700,000 which uh, helps to cover some of that hey Tanisha on yeah. the health insurance um, has the city ever um, analyzed self-insurance models with the stop loss and compared between the current approach um, self-insurance for health insurance mm -hmm. I don't know if we've ever, I don't know if we've analyzed that. I mean, we haven't done it in my tenure for sure. Um, the collaborative that we are with has been extremely beneficial to the city. And I say that coming from uh, a different collaborative, a different experience where that was not the case, was not a good deal uh, for the city and was also self-insured uh, in, in my previous community as well. Um, seeing year over year increases of, of you know five or six percent um, was happening at a time here when other communities for example rockville saw a 22 percent increase in their health insurance last year and we saw six six point eight six point eight so we have had a great experience so far with this with this cooperative i think we need to understand what's driving this trend 
Um, part of my challenge with the timing, uh, our insurance starts at the fiscal year start. So this being so late doesn't even give us options to kick tires uh, sure. for this current year. But if we don't get answers that we're satisfied with, we certainly will be looking at other options going forward. Switching carriers is difficult for, for employees. That's a hard, uh, hard thing to go through. So it has to be worth it. There are other intangible uh, costs that are related to changing carriers, but those are all things that we would evaluate. And if we go that route, the city will need a broker. So we've not needed a health insurance broker here um, for quite some time. I'm not sure if we've ever had one looking for Ken. a while back. Yeah. So that would be a route, a path that we would need to take if we just are completely dissatisfied with, um, you know, how this process shakes out and the answers we get about the renewal. Just as a point of information, what my employer did this year was kept the rates the same, but increased the deductibles and things along those lines so that their co cost was less as the as the increase to offset the increases i know that's that's not fun but yeah plan plan design changes um are always on the table and we've evaluated um, some options over the past few fiscal years but there's been nothing that seemed to um, it needs to be the as a juice needs to be worth the squeeze <laughs> right um and having having excellent health benefits is one of our differentiator factors you know as a public uh, as a public entity from a recruitment perspective so we have to keep that in mind as well and you know, when we think about the impact of inflation over the past couple of years and how our general wage increase hasn't necessarily kept pace right we, we try to balance all of those things and in, in keeping our people in mind to um, not have significant impacts on what their take-home pay is going to be so we, we look at all of those things but i think this one though it's not ideal um, and we still have a lot of questions about it it's one that we can work through if it's looking like things are going to be on this trajectory then we need to understand what our other options are but whatever they are we don't want to go the route of some of our uh, peers uh, because they are experiencing even higher increases so do you know if they're self-insured or if Rockville is self-insured? Yeah. I don't believe so. No. Okay, and maybe I mean I, I've had some experience in both models, and you still can keep like the same network. It's kind of as I understand the the process, you just have to have enough lives to make it actuarially stable. And with three or four hundred, you might be at that area, and you have yeah. the savings in terms of the insurance, you know, vig that they get uh, on it. Something to consider. Yeah, and, and I, I do think VIG is the right, the right <laughs> word for it. Um, you do pay, though, more on the administrative side, right? Because yeah. you need someone to administer the benefits, um, and it wouldn't be the current folks who are, who are doing that. So those costs increase the broker fee um, you'll need as well. Um, so it, it, there's a lot to consider when you do that. Um, the collaborative has been helpful because it's not just our 300 or 400 yeah lives we are in we've got the buying power of several different communities and all of their employees um, and the way that they have managed again I've, it took some convincing when I arrived because I had a poor experience with the collaborative um, in the past and here what I like about how they manage our um, experience is um, usually we actually get a refund every year that we are able to distribute right. some goes to the city to cover our costs and other and employees receive a check um, because they sort of balance out our experience over what they thought it was going to be when we did the renewal versus what it actually turns out to be um, and then the stop loss in place and then there's um, I forget the terms and other people we will be bored with it anyway but there are ways and the controls that they put in so that one community's bad experience doesn't negatively influence everyone else um, whether that's us or some other community so they find a way to level that out across uh, all of the participants so there were a lot of benefits we just have a lot of questions right now because we did not anticipate the double digit number. Tanisha, what's the percentage that the city covers on premiums versus the employees pay themselves? Uh, it's um, the city covers 85%. Thank you, right. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Okay. 
Uh, obviously, the other uh, increasing factor here at personnel services are the added uh, police officer positions. So we added four mid-year in this current year, and there are four proposed um, next year. And the operating budget, the increase is, is fairly modest, under, um, under half a million dollar, mostly driven by contractual increases and one-time maintenance projects that we'll talk about in the departments. And then transfers, while we've talked a lot about the reappropriation and it being larger, it's actually a bit smaller than it was last year, so you're seeing uh, a decrease there. Uh, but the majority of, of the enhancement is to the capital improvements and the asset replacement fund, which we talked about last week. Um, we actually may see this number go down even further, the transfer amount, as we received an award, the congressionally directed spending for Russell Avenue. Um, we will uh, receive that money in next fiscal year, and right now there there's a built-in transfer from the general fund to cover that project, and now we'll receive those dollars so we oh. can decrease the transfer. Procedural question, that's the million dollars that was announced? Yes. A, that's not retractable? Or it's done. It's a done. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. This is why we waited no, Lucy so long. Kicking the football. To, uh. We waited a long time to do an official announcement okay. because we've known for quite a while that we had made it through the process, but Congress actually has to... Uh, appropriate funds, which they did uh, in the spending bill so into January, maybe okay. early February. Tanisha, with the recruiting, with the new hire of the new police officers, um, this is really exciting given the temperature of police recruiting across the nation. Um, to tie back in with wage and benefits and, and, and wage and other benefits, is that what's driving, also driving? besides our amazing police force, um, these hires. Because it's incredible that Gaithersburg is hiring when we hear, you know, across the nation the struggle of recruiting. You know, I I, I want to bring the chief up to, to tell the story. I mean, I, I would, honestly, I say that we, we don't pay the most. Um, so we're not, we're not leading the market. We don't have a, like, I think, the I county has like a, a I 30. Want, some of it has to do with what with the people up here. A lot of it has to do with the culture that yeah, the gentleman yeah. over there. It is how great our, our, our department is, honestly. Yeah. I think that is the biggest recruiting factor for us because we aren't the highest paid. We aren't giving, you know, thirty and fifty thousand dollar hiring bonuses, though we have no vacancies. Um, actually we might have one, but <laughs> okay, so we have no vacancies. <laughs> while departments around us, uh, you know, experience double digit vacancy rates. And um, that's not been our challenge. And, and I credit the culture of the police department under the leadership of Chief Stroka and the command staff. And he will hate that explanation. So I'm also <laughs> gonna allow him to speak to it, which we can do under the, the, the police. Uh, yeah, we'll come back yeah. to that. Okay, we'll come back to it. So you can get your, <laughs> you can get your speech ready, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Okay, so here we go. Department summaries. We're going to cover um, each department. Some will go faster than others. Uh, we're gonna talk about highlights and significant budget changes uh, for each. For us, um, definitions, just quickly, a significant budget change, as you may have seen in the online budget book and in previous years, is anything that's, uh, is it $5,000? $5,000, yeah. Uh, up or down uh, counts as a significant budget change. So um, the office of the city manager includes administration, which is myself, and Dennis, and Tom. Um, the Economic Development Office, Mayor and Council Services, Communication and Public Engagement, Legislative Affairs, which Tom oversees, and our Racial Equity Program, which Hazel Monet oversees. Um, there are 18 employees total, uh, and this is just a slight change downward, which has to do with um, the reorganization of registration and elections budget. So registration and elections budget used to be in the city attorney's office, which included a part-time uh, person. Um, so not only did that move over to mayor and council services, but also because we don't have an election in FY25, the part-time position 
um, is not budgeted for. So it comes back every other year. So that's that change. Total budget for this whole office is 3.7 million, which is down 2%, again, mainly driven by that shift uh, in registration and elections budget uh, because those expenses were removed for FY25. Um, there are cyclical costs being added uh, for the biennial survey. We know we skipped a few years. We will be back on track with the survey for FY25. And then just FOIA software expenses, which is related to uh, the mayor and council services office, mainly the city clerk taking over the process of overseeing our MPIA requests. So any questions here? Office of the City Attorney, again, registration and elections budget was moved. Um, additional outside council funding was added to the budget, and this is to assist with the transition as uh, we have a new city attorney come on board and we are able to uh, use the firms that we have on retainer, maybe a little bit more um, through this transition, so funds are available there. There are four employees total, and um, the down one FTE, there were two administrative positions in the city attorney's office. And through discussion with former city attorney Lynn Ford, um, when one person retired, we reviewed those um, duties and we were able to divide some of them up so that the mayor and council services office, uh, the city clerk has taken over uh, many of those. And then um, the legislative, no, I'm sorry, I have, I have Jamil in my brain. <laughs> the, uh, it's always the a good thing. <laughs> legal, legal services um, uh, position has has taken over and will do most of the administrative support for that department as well as um, some other special assignments uh, that was taken care of between those two. So that's why there's a less FTE there. Um, total budget of 890,000, which is down again, mostly because of the registration and elections budget moving, but also because of the look less FTE, one less FTE. Questions? Oops. Uh, Department of Human Resources. Uh, so this is a good time to explain. In some cases, the org chart reflects divisions um, actual divisions that are headed by people and in other cases the org chart reflects functions of the department so in this case we're looking at functions um, so they oversee recruitment and retention benefits and compensation employee training and development performance appraisals safety and health employee relations and policy development there are 6.5 employees I don't know how that's possible can you figure that out part time oh and there is hours. there's part time hours but I don't think they've not used them. Uh, so 6.5 employees, one and a half million total budget, which has essentially no change in both of those. Um, we have added some additional funding for employee appreciation and recognition. Um, we are on, we've just wrapped our third year of an engagement survey process um, where our numbers overall are really good from an engagement perspective when we look across um, actually national trends and, and other standards, our numbers are very high, but where we have opportunities to continue to improve is how we recognize and show employees that we appreciate them. So we continue to invest there, um, and we want to continue implementation of that engagement initiatives, which includes training for all of our managers and supervisors to help improve in that area. This is one thing that's um, at the top of my priority list and making sure that we have uh, we maintain a great environment uh, where employees want to come to work. That is another differentiator for us that um, it, with retention and recruitment, I think if we continue to invest um, in our environment, our culture, and, and basically our supervisors who set the tone for that, they're, they're the ones who um, have a significant influence on whether the employee's day-to-day -day experience is a positive one. So we want to make sure that we're investing in supervisors and we all know that over time, um, we all tend, no matter the industry, we promote people who are really good at their technical job. Uh, and then we expect them to just know how to manage people. Um, so I wanna make sure that we're always trying to get better at that. And so this is reflected here. 
Tanisha, on, on retention and turnover, do we track um, versus like peer groups or peer city, like our retention and turnover versus others in general and how it stacks up? Um, I know that Kim participates in an HR group. I love when I turn around and like nobody's moving. <laughs> Okay. Tanisha, you want to just repeat that for people watching? So, so Kim is saying they do. Ha there is a sort of regional um, HR group, and they okay. will bounce those kinds of things off of one another. That question's not been raised or asked, where there's a comparison. In my in my similar group for city administrators, so the the I want to say COG, the Council of Governments. I'm not going to say the whole thing. Uh, we have a CAO group. We are always comparing police uh, turnover rate because that's a significant one that most communities are struggling with. For us, I think um, the challenges are in our public works department, which yeah. we actually are trying. We're starting to see a turnaround, but we can calculate that number. We have recently, actually. We just haven't gotten a comparison to other communities, so that's something that we can. We can get. Okay. Next up, the Department of Community, Neighborhood, and Housing Services. Um, there are 27.65 employees, uh, which, which means anytime you see a or, uh, decimal point there, that means there are part-time hours that are budgeted for. That's down a little bit, um, just a change in, in part-time hours that are being included uh, across one or more of those divisions. The divisions include neighborhood services, housing and community development, community services, homeless services, and the Financial Empowerment Center, which is a subset of community services. Total budget is about 4.7 million. There's not a significant change there in their budget year over year. And the, there's um, some enhancements here. So there's new programming uh, for the Wells Robertson House through a Mary Center grant that we actually received in this fiscal year and some of those funds will carry over uh, and programming will carry over. Um, increased funding for the hoarding task force which we talked a little bit about I think last week and an increased promotional educational materials budget for community services programs as they continue to get out in the community and make sure they're aware of all that we can do for them. So those are some highlights there. Finance and administration, um, again, sort of organized by function. Um, so procurement, um, administration of the finance department, accounting operations, general services, and budget um, are the functions there. There are 12 employees. Um, I think, are all of your offers accepted now? Do you have any? Yes. Vacancy? No vacancies. Very early stages of acceptance, but <laughs> she yeah, doesn't so want to say to we, knock on something. We don't want to jinx it. We don't want to jinx it. Um, so there was some transition there, but we're very excited that it, it appears they're moving back toward full staffing. A two point one million dollar total budget, which is a small uh, one percent increase. Um, there was a reduction in auditor's fees, which we continue to see with our new audit partner. Yeah, and that was partly last year there was an increase budgeted just because I wasn't sure with, with it being a new contract that there might be some additional charges for things. So, um, so we're back to the contracted rate. And then annual maintenance fees for our new budget software. So we talked about the, the change in budget software. So that's also been added. Uh, to the uh, question that's open gov, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. On the last work session or the introduction meeting we had, you talked about additional capabilities in OpenGov for like community engagement or things like that. Do our current budgets or fees cover if you ever wanted to release that or is that an additional cost? The things I mentioned are included. I, I believe the community engagement, I can't find. I know, where are they? <laughs> <laughs> the community engagement piece, I think they demonstrated us and I believe it is available. Um, okay. They, of course, have features that are additional, but everything I had mentioned was Included. Excellent. Thank you. Questions? More questions here? Department of Information Technology. Um, so these are divisions. So there's business systems and transformation services, 
geographic information systems and data services, network operations and security services, and IT central support services. Um, this was one we got a few questions uh, from council members about the personnel seem to change and zero out and come back. Um, these division names changed and then we had titles change for the staff uh, follow that. Um, there are 16.70 employees. There's an increase in part-time hours, which is actually reflected below. Um, it was uh, initially thought to be a summer position and now it's been um, enhanced to a year-round part-time position. Uh, 2.9 million total budget, which is a 10% change. Um, mostly driven by increased contractual increases in telecommunications, for example, uh, which went up significantly, and funding included for the IT security assessment compliance. So we recently did um, some internal and external pen testing and full assessment of our security um, posture uh, and got some recommendations back that we want to move forward with in the next fiscal year. Uh, we haven't exactly narrowed down how we're going to prioritize those, but we wanted to make sure there were dollars in the budget to allow us to address those recommendations. An IT question, um, for some of the software packages like Office 365 or others that can be acquired on a monthly basis, yearly basis, and some on multi-year basis, have we ever like explored like multi-year licenses for things like that and see what discounts can be offered? I think they go up to five years you can lock in some terms uh, for that. I believe we're in long-term contracts on all of those major software packages. Yeah, and I do believe they take that into account where there's discounts available for okay. prepaying or, yeah. yeah. We also try to work with uh, neighboring jurisdictions like Montgomery County, <laughs> who has a much better deal and more buying power than we do with like Microsoft. Oh, so for the seat licenses, you get better. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Tisha, are we seeing um, additional charges here with uh, 16 South Summit coming online and uh, obviously having an additional IT infrastructure to maintain over there. I don't think there's, go ahead. We'll have a, there's some warranty period with that building, so some of the costs won't occur until later on. Uh, we are projecting those costs, uh, not in this budget, but we're kind of preparing um, those costs up front. So there will be additional costs. Uh, mostly for the security system, mm -hmm. uh, the doors and the cards and everything like that. Um, there is an annual maintenance fee that we provide because we need, you know, 24-hour turnaround. So that's right. Okay, thank you. Department of Parks, Recreation, and Culture um, includes the divisions of Recreation Services, Sports and Youth Services, Facilities and Admin Services, and Cultural Events and Services. 1.3 or 130.47 employees, which is up 0.74 FTE, which again, additional part time hours, an $11.5 million total budget. I think so. Yeah. And uh, some of the highlights and significant budget changes here. Um, so we are expanding our summer camp programs to meet demand. We are seeing a lot more demand there. There's a revenue offset with that, so it doesn't um, necessarily show up in uh, the budget the way you might expect that to show, but there is a revenue offset there, so that was definitely something we wanted to do. Um, expanding inclusive programming and events, um, which includes, I think, additional part-time hours. Funding for the Kentlands Mansion 30th anniversary event. Um, we also converted two part-time positions into one full-time sports coordinator position and some additional professional development for new staff. If you've not been over recently, we have a, a lot of new leaders over in Parks, Rec, and Culture. Um, so, and they replaced long-tenured employees who may not have been as active and engaged in the professional development at that point in their careers. So we want to make sure that we provide funds for you mentioned a revenue component of that. So is that a, an $11.5 million net, or is that the expense, and then there's revenue yeah. that will offset that number? That's just the expense piece yes. there. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for so that. Where do we put all those people? There's not 130 people sitting in that building. So are they all vir mostly virtual, part-time? They show up when there's an activity? Well, this, this department has a lot of part-timers, right, that, that mm -hmm. work 
uh, for their activities. And then, of course, the staff swells and uh, for seasonal, for summer uh, positions and programs. So and there's several buildings, too. And there's Casey there, and, there are and several the youth centers. Even so, there's not enough room for all 30 people. So I'm not, assuming they're that never a, all there all at once. Right. right. So it's full-time equivalent. A lot, a, probably a lot more than 130 actual humans, but some of them working three months out of the year, things like that, right? That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So the full-time equivalent hours, when we say FTE, mm -hmm. um, it's based on 2,080 hours in a year. Um, so we... Unfortunately, for budget purposes, reduce people to hours. Uh, so uh, that is, as you're, you're right, there's likely much more uh, staff involved in that number, but the hours that they work uh, could vary, you know, from 15, 10, 15 to sometimes 40 hours if they're working just the summer season, for example, full time in our camp. So um, I did also want to point out that this current fiscal year, because of how the July holiday fell, we had two summer fests that we needed to fund in the current fiscal year. Um, and next fiscal year, we go back to just funding one. Uh, so that, even though it looks like we've, we've added a bunch to their uh, budget for this next fiscal year, but the budget didn't change much. It's, there was a lot involved in the two summer fests. So taking one away uh, was a lot of significant funding. There's also um, a, a few one-time projects that were approved for this current fiscal year that don't carry forward uh, into the next year. And then there was a decrease in expenses related to meals at the Benjamin Gaither Center. Um, so that was just really a change in how the meals are paid for. It used to be a pass-through, so we needed to budget for it. Um, now there's a direct pay, uh, so that expense doesn't show up. It looks like a reduction um, or that the meals are no longer being served. They are. They're just being paid for differently. For our summer camps, are, are those revenue neutral? or? Um, and, and I ask no. in the context of now that I have kids at summer camp age yeah. and friends and parents of those folks that um, the, 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 the consensus is our summer camps are absurdly cheap compared to what other products are on the market? I would say accessible. I would call them accessible, right? So, uh, you know, as a, as a parks and rec and culture department, you know, as a, as a city, we want to provide a service. Um, obviously, there's um, tax-supported services and there are fee-supported services. We don't have any what I would call enterprise uh, services. We have some that are closed. Stormwater certainly functions as an enterprise um, service where the fees cover all of the expenses and then some there. But for things like Parks, Rec, and Culture, um, programs like Summer Camp and other programs that they offer, we want to make sure that they're accessible. Um, so we do that in, in several ways, trying to keep our fees competitive and low and accessible. Um, there are some things that that's not taken into account, right? So programming at the Arts Barn, for example, you're gonna go catch a show, um, it's gonna be priced differently than if we're offering um, a camp for teens that we're trying to make sure we're engaging youth um, over the summer or during downtime. So no, they don't, the fees don't cover all of the costs. Certainly there's some uh, supplement coming from the general fund, but we would expect to see that in a, in a parks department for a city. Tanisha, I remember when uh, we were negotiating with MCPS about Tubman, Tubman Elementary, one of the things that we were talking about was access to the building. Are we going to be using Tubman for summer camps this year going forward? I, we use the field, so. Yes. Come, come on up to the Rebecca. microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not with Sports and News Services anymore, but I do know the answer to this. Awesome. We are using it as an ELO site, so for four weeks we'll do a half-day camp after um, the after-school program. ELO? Um, extended learning opportunities, so there's summer school there, and then we will be in there for a couple hours providing summer camp. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? <laughs> Uh, planning and code administration, um, permits and inspections, planning and administration are uh, the divisions here. Um, FTE down uh, by 0.46, basically part-time hours. Um, the budget's down slightly. Um, 
and the total budget's $4.2 million. So some of the uh, significant highlights for the next fiscal year, the staff will be, they'll begin to work on the land use and transportation master plan elements. So we, we made our way through the housing elements, um, winding down the retool, which was another major one. And then they'll, they'll start to do the prep work on land use and transportation master plan. Um, obviously work will continue on the Lake Forest redevelopment project um, and the InterGov customer self-service upgrade and implementation. Um, I wish Ryan were here, but we'll, we'll text him and make sure he knows as soon as he's able to do some of these services online. I'm looking forward to renewing my pet license online. Um, so that, that's all coming. We're very excited about that. Um, Is there going to be a, um, I think I'm excited to, for that as well. <laughs> Is it going to be some kind of chart or like which services are going from like the PDF manual forms to online uh, self-service type? Like what's in, what's in, what's out? And that. Yeah, that'll all be rolled out. Yeah. But uh, who's wants to? Oh, Dennis, you're going to talk to. Me. Okay, <laughs> go for it. Sorry, Dennis. I thought it was going to be joking. As we roll out the services, we have looked at the ones that have the highest touch point. So uh, rental licenses along with pet licenses are going to be uh, the two that we try to roll out first. We will do a campaign um, with the staff uh, rolling those out and indicating, um, especially on pet licenses, we have the opportunity and rental licenses to work that into the notification when we're sending renewals that this is an opportunity to do that. Um, so we'll, we have a schedule, um, but we're just starting with that. We think we'll get some of them uh, rolled out here uh, by the end of the summer. Um, so we'll keep council posted on those. Excellent. I know it's small dollars, but like this will save like the postcards getting mailed to people's houses. We but still will do postcards okay. as renewals to some extent, at least initially, uh, okay. and then we will be converting to email um, for those renewals. But okay. We want to make sure we have that transition. Sure. Uh, for those people who might not be following their email address as closely as they need to. Well, in okay. some cases, we don't have email addresses yeah. Yeah. as well. So. But sort of three, five, seven years from now, this will be mostly an online process. Yes. Thank you. Tanisha, for uh, the the upgrade and implementation of Intergov, does the IT, FTE IT staff do that work, or is it contracted services? Mm -hmm. No, it's done uh, in partnership with, with IT. Okay. So if if we look at the IT budget, is that is that does that sit in the IT budget that work or does it sit in planning and code? The work to do the implementation? Right. So is it part of the <coughs> FTE staff that's already there? Yes. Okay, so that's baked in. That's those projects those projects that that IT is matrix to work to work on. That's already baked into that staffing for IT for the year. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Brian's Brian Helms's team, the Business Transformation Services team, helps in uh, to oversee in some cases, in other cases, work in partnership and help to manage our major implementation. Okay. Okay. So I will note there are some consulting professional services involved with the Intergov where, and those costs are captured in the okay. In the code division. Okay. Special training, things like that, that we do. We have access to um, on the, I wouldn't call it on demand, but I'm thinking about Munis and, um, you know, we always have built in services where we can work with the vendor to access training and other special services beyond our IT staff. Okay. But it's, so our that hands. would be reflected in the uh, cost for the software, you know, in that line item, not the IT. Staff. Okay. But we're, the vendor isn't doing, particularly for this upgrade, the implementation upgrade, that's city IT folks' hands who are on the keyboard. Yes, there, the there are some professional services involved in, in conjunction. So mostly it's our IT and the system administrator within planning and code, but they consult with okay. the system. Okay. Yeah. Chief, you ready? Uh, so, Department of Police, uh, we have Administration and Emergency Management, Special Ops, Operations Bureau, and the Administrative Bureau. Um, 86.26 employees, um, that's up. Uh, obviously, the eight positions we talked about, and then there's some part-time hours um, increasing there. 
um, overall budget, 17% uh, change to 13.4 million proposed for next year. And we've talked about the police officer positions. Um, there's also obviously related training equipment, vehicles and supplies uh, that come along with adding new officers. Um, we're also replacing 14 mobile defibrillators. Um, I, if you're wondering the same, Jansky, there was a, why were those coming out of the police department? But they're mobile, right? So I initially thought of our buildings and I couldn't understand why that was in the police department's budget, but they are past their useful life and need to be uh, replaced. And then um, uh, we're doing an, a promotion in the police department. We'll be filling uh, the captain's position and then there's obviously successive promotions that happen after that. So um, there are funds involved to hire our consultant that administers the promotional process. So I think it'd be a good opportunity to hear from the chief about his thoughts on why our recruitment retention efforts um, are so successful. So, chief. Tanisha, while the chief's coming up, um, the parking uh, program that we're looking to implement, would that fall, uh, enforcement, would that fall under the police's budget? And I know there was talk about adding IT uh, infrastructure for that as well. Where would that okay. fall? I saw people moving. <laughs> So uh, there is some money included in the budget. It's on the CIP side for, um, for the first year. For the first year. And then I believe there would be an ongoing software cost after that year one. We currently have enforcement. You know, the police department currently has um, a version of, of the software we currently use, and that is in their current budget. In regard to recruitment and retention, we lose about three to four officers a year. Um, mostly of those are recently been through retirements, which is, which is which is healthy for the organization. Overall, the staff does a re very good job that I have with the year-round recruiting um, that we do. So we can anticipate vacancies. It's also helpful that we have the ability, because we have a supportive city manager for overhires. If we didn't have overhires, the ability to do the overhires knowing that have three to four vacancies a year, we would have vacancies in spite of the outstanding work of the staff with recruitment. But there's four things <coughs> regards to the size of an agency that's critical to keeping the police department fully staffed. And that means regardless of its size, <coughs> in this country, I'm a firm believer in this, it has to be it has to be properly led. It has to be properly funded. It has to be properly staffed. And it has to have the political support from its elected officials to support the best of policing and to hold the chief of police accountable for anything less than professional or anything less than constitutionally sound policing. To do those four things, I don't believe we would have a staffing crisis with policing in this country. So I'm, I get, all the credit really does go to my staff with their recruitment uh, that they do year round. It goes to the city manager for her allowing me to do the overhires and for your support of this department for many, many years. It doesn't go unrecognized and it's very much appreciated because without it, those other three, three things that I mentioned really wouldn't matter. And that's what we enjoy here. So, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thanks. Hey, Tanisha, question maybe for you and or the chief. Um, the eight police officer positions, are they all patrol officers or is there supervision, supervisors built into that? Well, the eight are patrol, but there's, chief, do you want to talk about Yeah, so the, the, where I'm going with the question is that at what level of additional patrol do you need, like a supervisor also added to that mix? Our goal is to add officers to each of the six shifts with the, getting a minimum of seven officers on each shift. Okay. Okay. I will have one extra officer that will be reassigned to our investigative sections as a detective to handle, handle the increase in follow-up investigations as a result of the increased calls for service. So seven of them will go to patrol and one will go to the investigative sections to do the follow-up criminal investigations. 
if span you span of control, we're still that's what I was just going to. We're within still within the five to eight span okay. of control, like that, because you, we have a sergeant. You anticipated my question. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. We're still within the span of control. Thank you. Other questions? Almost done. Departments, uh, Department of Public Works. Um, the divisions are engineering services, environmental services, operations, and facility maintenance and capital programs. And then there's administration and sustainability program, which is part of environmental services. Um, so 104.46 employees, uh, no change there. An increase in budget of uh, 2%. Um, there are a few things I want to point out. Uh, that may not have jumped off the page at you, but we were pretty excited about. Um, we are looking at an estimated $100,000 uh, $100, reduction for our electricity for streetlights. And that is a direct result of the multi-year uh, swap out program where we've converted to LED lights. Um, so we're starting to experience, we started to experience um, some of that decrease over the past couple of years, but as more lights have been converted, we're now starting to realize the full impact of that. Um, so those are all the city-owned lights. Uh, we continue to be in, we'll call them discussions with uh, PEPCO and other municipalities about how um, the PEPCO-owned lights will be um, dealt with, but we, we will continue our project through completion and we are starting to see those results. So we're very excited about that. Tanisha, is it also expected, so that's just pure electricity savings, mm -hmm. is it expected there will be some material savings because the bulbs get replaced less often? There should be, I don't know if we quantified what that is. Um, when we did the project, I don't think we quantified yeah. that amount. I believe we um, did a cost-benefit analysis and it's about a 12-year payback. I will point out too that we received, we received 600000 in grant money to offset. Um, to offset some of that cost too. We still have some grants that are still outstanding for phase five, which will be the last phase in 25. Did the 12 year payback include the factor in the grant money or was uh, that above did, and beyond? I'm not sure if it did or not. I'd have to go back and look at the calculations. Sure. That's what I remember all the time. It likely didn't though, no. because we wouldn't have had them at the time. <clears throat> so I noticed that when we approve replacement vehicles, for example, and that goes for like public works as well as police. Um, we, we talk about fuel efficiency and, and uh, moving to vehicles that are more fuel efficient. I know we had this discussion in the past and we've had some approvals where I've seen hybrid vehicles coming through. I think our parking enforcement cars are more fuel efficient vehicles. I don't have a good sense as to where we are as a, as a holistic view on moving away from um, purely gas guzzling cars to hybrid to electrification of the fleet. Um, do you have a sense of that? I don't, I wouldn't say that we have a formalized plan. I don't know if you know, last year we talked a little bit about some of the smaller pieces of equipment, but Tony, if you want to talk about our approach there with hybrid or electric? Yes, we don't have a formalized plan, but we do have um, an, an informal plan to, that looks at alternative fuel vehicles. So, so far, I think our number is eight total for the city that are 100% electric. We have two parking enforcement vehicles, like you mentioned, and we have six other vehicles that are out of public works. And so we have, um, I don't know what our total number of um, equipment pieces are. But we do have um, them identified over a ser over the course of 10 years of how we can transition to um, what we're calling an alternative fuel um, type of approach because as this, as this evolves, it may not be exactly all electric. Um, some of our existing police vehicles are also hybrid, so they're gas over electric. Uh, they don't plug in, but they have a, you know, an electric component to it. Um, so that's where we stand currently, um, and we hope to we hope to actually, over the course of later this year, um, come back at another work session um, to, you know, present more information on our um, plan for that, okay. that type of conversion. I think that'd be very interesting. Thanks, yeah. Tom. We did receive a uh, state grant last year that helped us develop, um, look, take a look at our fleet and some of our 
some of the necessary infrastructure that will be needed to um, have more electric vehicles. Because currently we have just three chargers that were at PW internal for use. Even better when we're spending other people's money to do the stuff. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Speaking of other people's money, the other thing we're trying to investigate is there's a, a program included in the Inflation Reduction Act um, that would allow us, so typically when you see energy savings uh, as a credit program, they typically go to private companies, right? Because those companies actually file taxes and then they can get a tax credit. Um, they have realized that there's incentive for public institutions uh, to do something similar. And so they have worked out some sort of credit program that we're trying to wrap our heads around and understand uh, so that we might be able to participate um, obviously, there's expenditure on the front side, and then there's some opportunity to try to recover those costs um, through something similar to a private sector company tax credit. So we're looking into that as well. Um, okay, other things. There are several large maintenance uh, replacement projects planned. Um, for some reason, I lost my notes, so now I'm going to go from memory. So we're doing three. I know Janice is like, eek. We're doing three boiler replacements, uh, one at Public Works, one at Wells, and one at um, Kentland's Mansion. Yes. yes. Yeah, I got that one right. Um, we're also doing a floor refinishing project in one of the rooms at Kentland's Mansion. Uh, we're doing another flooring project at Casey. Um, we're doing some uh, repairs at the mini golf course. Uh, there's some issues with the carpet, some holes, just some wear and tear that needs to be replaced. Um, that's uh, deemed a bit of a large maintenance project. And I'm trying to think where there are others. To need a question, the, sure. the boilers like at the Kentlands or Casey, et cetera, there are heating units generally to provide heating for the... Boilers are heating yeah. units, yes. Have we ever looked at um, with like a geothermal loop that can replace that and sort of what the <coughs> delta... Um, don't know the answer to that, do you? Tony, Tony you want to come back up? Geothermal loop. I know we're going to investigate that maybe for our new project. But I don't believe we've investigated that at this point. Okay. I, you know, being sitting here for like, going on nine years now, I never realized that Robertson Park Youth Center operates on a geothermal loop. And so we've implemented the technology. It's just the question. And, I guess sitting here from the dais, I'll, 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 I'll foot stomp, as I do perennially. Um, the sustainability initiatives are, are, are wholly supported by me. I think it's wholly supported by us, but I'll just throw that out there to anybody who's listening. That, that's the kind of stuff that I like to see in the budget. So. That would be, especially when there's replacements. Um, I know the Ketlins and the HOA, they put a geothermal loop and saved a ton of money and has a long useful life. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the, if the cost benefit is there, but it's worth at least exploring and seeing. It, I think you're it, right. I think to, to Councilmember Wu's point, um, with the youth center being a new construction versus retrofit, I think there's some consideration there, but yeah. it, it's certainly worth um, further investigation. Yeah, at the Kentlands Clubhouse, when that work was done, there was an arrangement made uh, with the state of Maryland where the data was shared with them on the performance and cost. Mm -hmm. So there may be some additional data available to you to, to justify or not justify the project going forward. Yeah. We could, I think Jamil and I could connect you with the right people on that. Thank you. If that's helpful. And we, look, we looked at it again since then to like, for like expanding the loop and to have, at least from what we saw, I think it was about three years ago, you know, vertical installations, horizontal installations, it's kind of a bit more. Um, more optionality in terms of retrofits was really interesting. So. And you might strike oil as a <laughs> <laughs> So, no, I now echo uh, Council Member Woos. Anytime we have an opportunity to look for that, um, we should. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, the other project I missed is replacement of the sign at Boer Park, the electronic sign. Um, you might have noticed one side just doesn't work well anymore we actually do that in partnership with the school district um, so that's been budgeted for next year um, a few smaller changes uh, we are uh, going to experience an increase in fuel for next year but 
not as large as the increase was planned for the for this current budget year. So overall, the increase is about thirty thousand um, uh, for for fuel. We are also undergoing a project. Uh, we're replacing. Dennis is going to talk about that. We're replacing our fuel um, facility at Public Works, and so we'll have a. We're going to work on a temporary arrangement with another public partner so that we can access. Um, hopefully access their fuel pumps while our project was uh, underway so we're not having to pay retail prices which would have been extremely expensive in, in, in addition to whatever sourcing contracts you have for fuel mm -hmm. does the city employ any like hedging or forwards for commodity purchases no, we don't. okay or southwest huh <laughs> southwest um, i think that covers all the major projects um, and then there, while well, we talked about uh, street light, electricity costs going down, um, of all the utility costs we've got, obviously all the utilities, water, um, natural gas, electricity, we are seeing some other increases in our facilities for electricity that are anticipated. So um, we continue to look for ways to reduce uh, those costs, LED lights, other types of you know, automatic um, dimmers and, and those sorts of things as we move to newer facilities or we do other upgrades, um, those will help us over time, but we are seeing a little bit <coughs> increase there. How are our water bills doing? I know mine have gone way up. The what? Water bills, WSSC. We actually aren't anticipating um, huge increase there. I think there actually might have been a decrease forecasted based on um, usage. Is that, is that trying jump, to think. jump out for you, Janice? I'm going to flip through the list real quick. Yeah, I think it, and I'm not sure if there was a big decrease. But it's not huge, no, but but it wasn't, there wasn't an increase. It's actually a, a small decrease. Okay, in well, I'll have to investigate in my yeah. house. Then. You may want to check for <laughs> leaks. have a leak. Silent leak. No, check for leaks. I have a, bu a busy yeah. salon downstairs, I think, is the cause, but. Ah. <laughs> Just Those <laughs> leaks will kill you. Just okay. to raise a longer, longer term thing, and maybe I'm going to hear a sigh from Dennis on this. And a conversation we had early on in my tenure here about uh, installation of solar in the city. So I think all of us have noticed in recent uh, recent times there's been some noticeable installations at NIST. There's a no, there's an installation on Watkins Mill. I think it's the um, whoever that health center is there. I can't remember. Kaiser. 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 I'm completely blanking. Um, it, 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 it's coming, um, and, and it, it's here, and I don't think it's here for the city. Um, I, I don't know if it, you know, in the context of our prior conversation, this is before your time, Tanisha, we, we talked about installation of solar on our facilities. Um, I think we, we came to the conclusion that it was not economically or structurally feasible to pursue. Um, but I would like to talk, uh, you know, it, to the extent that we're learning lessons from, you know, our partners in the city, um, installing solar, you know, I'm wondering if it's time to start looking at, at that again, not necessarily on our rooftops, which is what we looked at before, but um, using available land to, to help better. Did you sigh? <laughs> <laughs> For those of us who've been around long enough. <laughs> uh, we did do the analysis on land, and we did propose some sites. Uh, we can go back and reevaluate those sites. Um, it was mostly a council decision not to use the land in that form or fashion, because uh, again, most of the land that we'd be putting these on are parkland. Um, we are looking at solar for the activity center, so we're redoing the roof there, and we're making sure the structure can do it. And then I'll also note that we're doing looking at the green roof at the public works building of possibly changing it from a green roof to a solar roof um, in that capacity, because it's probably one of the better sites we have in terms of collection. Dennis, has there been any thought given to doing uh, solar over the um, parking lot at 16 South Summit, the way that the county uh, facility has? We didn't look at that in terms of um, construction. Those are some things we could do. You know, actually the larger um, site we have is the activity center mm -hmm. in terms of parking. Um, we haven't done those. I think one of the things that we are waiting on is this new uh, treasury uh, 
program because it would allow us to get the tax benefits rather than uh, forming an alliance with a private agency, which is a lot what you have to do to do some of those projects is that you hire someone to do it, they do all the work, and then they pay you back over the cost savings, right? Um, so I think we'll see a little bit more exploration in terms of that once the Treasury kind of releases all the requirements uh, for us to qualify for those programs. Okay. And uh, my favorite department, non-department, um, <laughs> I'm joking. You're all my favorite departments. Uh, so here all those is, people were the <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Here's where we um, have transfers and what we call other citywide activities. So um, some of the highlights here is that there is a slightly smaller transfer to the capital improvements fund as we talked about which actually will decrease even more of about a million um, we've increased the transfer to the asset replacement fund um, we are really uh, starting uh, well, actually we might be in our second or third year of experiencing um, significant increases in um, some of the assets that we have accounted for there that we've saved uh, money for replacement over time and then once it's time to make the purchase um, even our um, escalator hasn't kept pace with with inflation and so the the cost to replace is more than we've saved uh, and so we're pulling more money out of the fund so this is just going to help uh, replenish some of that um, estimated costs for legal support related to 16 south summit uh, construction project litigation um, so that's a, a huge increase uh, shown in this department. And then increased transfers to the other post-employment benefits fund, which is, those are planned, that's a planned increase following our funding formula. Um, Council Member Harris has asked for a regular OPEB report. Um, so we'll begin to share a report with the mayor and council um, on uh, where the fund stands and um, distributions, that sort of thing. So you can... When, when was the last, there was like, I remember watching in one of the city council meetings before I came on where there was like a consultant that came in and they did an analysis and methodology. How long ago was that? And then, Council Member you're looking for like an annual update or what's the sequence? I just like to see money in, money out, make sure okay. I have some idea. It's a, I mean, it's a separate fiduciary fund that we don't have control over, but where the budget includes money going out of our out of our budget so we should know what's going on as well yeah seems and that, reasonable do you know what, when, it, when that was the study was done in uh two years ago 22 and i so think it was 22, 22. It, okay. the uh the changes so, yeah. to how we fund it began with the fy 23 you were on the council mm -hmm. yeah yeah what's last that? couple years we were, yeah we were on the council yeah. in that happened, yes so. you were on the council and uh you know a good, good practice there is to do that kind of study every five years five so years we now. plan to renew that um, in the meantime, uh, just for everyone's understanding, we do have a committee um, that is called the GERP. It's a great the acronym. What? GERP. It's the GERP. GERP. Uh, so the Who's Gaithers in charge of your acronym? <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get around it. It's the Gaithersburg <laughs> Employee Retirement Programs Committee. Um, so we oversee uh, lots of retirement programs, not just the OPEB fund. Um, so we have the committee, uh, I'm on the committee, uh, finance director is on the committee, our comptroller is on the committee, so is um, the deputy city manager, and we work in conjunction with our consultant, Bolton, um, to do things like make sure we have all of the adequate fiduciary training that we're supposed to have, obviously overseeing all the funds. Um, we have gone to open architecture for our defined contribution retirement program, so that's a you know, management of uh, performance there and whether we need to remove managers or put them on a watch list. Um, so monitoring performance there. Education is a big deal for our committee and making sure our participants are um, educated on um, financial wellness and everything that goes into that and they have access through our other partner, Mission Square. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty robust uh, process and, and certainly our fiduciary training um, keeps us on our toes because it's always uh, frightening. Uh, so 
we're happy to provide a regular report and uh, you all can do it with, with it what you will uh, what in general we are on track uh, with what the consultants projected and we don't anticipate any major changes uh, to the funding schedule that we laid out and the council approved um, but we'll certainly share information okay and then um, we have a little bit of increase uh, in insurance premiums but it's less than the increase in previous year so it's um, we're, that's still something we want to take a look at if you all read my weekly report you can see there's an untouched action item that I haven't been able to make it to which is an evaluation of our uh, insurance program um, we we have a lot of partnerships for our insurance program which could be serving us well I just want to do some analysis to make sure that's the case in, a, in another life um, I was a risk manager and so I enjoy that kind of stuff so I need to review um, our insurance program but that's all the major changes there and are there any questions before I turn things over to Janice to talk about the five-year forecast? Neil's favorite. Yeah, don't, don't start me up. <laughs> <laughs> no, go right ahead. Thank you. Do you want me to, I can drive. Sure. Okay. Okay, good evening. The city's five-year plan is meant to give a general idea of the city's financial direction and provide an assessment of the medium-term outlook. Staff develop general principles for the anticipated behavior of revenue and expenses with some revisions each year to determine what the longer term outlook is. The more certainty we have about a behavior of a re about our revenue and expenses, the better we are able to predict how the revenue and expense will look in the future. For the current year, excluding reappropriations, we're projecting the revenue to surpass the budget by 3.6 million. This overage is primarily due to higher investment earnings than budgeted resulting from the studying of interest rates um, and how those impact our bonds other revenue that is also outperforming the budget is related to the state aid police grant and the revenue sharing from montgomery county due to the supplemental reappropriation um, mid-year that tanisha mentioned earlier so most of of the other revenues are anticipated to be in line with the budget for fy24 we're projecting a reappropriation of 7.2 million from the fund balance versus the 10.8 million that was budgeted and so I'll, I'll note again that as Tanisha mentioned that there's there may be changes between now and the end of the year so when looking at the five-year plan in the FY25 proposed budget book you'll notice that we show continued use of the fund balance between FY25 and FY29 the primary use of the fund balance is to cover transfers to our capital improvement plan while we show the continued use of the fund balance, the balance does not go below the target, which is 25% um, of the average prior three-year expenses. Staff will, to continu will continue to refine the details of the five-year five forecast annually to ensure the recurring expenditures are paid with recurring revenues and that the city maintains a structurally balanced budget. Generally, the five-year forecast does not take into account one-time revenues or expenditures that have a high degree of uncertainty. Hey, Janice. Yes. Question on for my benefit and maybe the benefit of the public um the 25 percent target how is that derived so like why not 30 why not 20. so 25 is the recommended minimum from okay. the government finance officers association yes. right. and so as you can see we're typically well above that which is sure. ideal for pay-as-you-go cities such as ourselves so yeah. okay so should you go to the next one no worries Okay, so, so after the refine, at this, we made refinements to the five-year forecast in FY23. So we wanted to compare the five-year forecast from FY24 with our FY25 forecast. And so this chart shows the five-year plan as displayed in FY24 with the fund balance trend line for both years. And so the fund balance for FY25 is the yellow line. At a high level, you'll notice that there is an increase in the revenue and expenses, and the trend line for fund balance shows a larger decrease in the out years to anticipate, due to anticipated capital project transfers needed in FY25 and 26. Overall, the revenues for the same periods between FY24 and FY28 in the FY24 plan versus the FY25 plan are 5.1% 5, 5 higher, and the expenses are 7.1% higher, and that's due to the additional anticipated capital transfers. When looking back over the years at the five-year forecast compared to actuals for FY19 through FY23, we have generally under-forecasted revenue and over-forecasted expenses. 
With the changes to the five-year plan made in recent years, we expect to see these differences shrink. However, I'll note that many of these differences can be attributed to non-recurring revenue items that can be difficult to pro project in the future years or un unanticipated savings. Some examples Tanisha mentioned earlier, but just to <coughs> rename some of them is um, the Washingtonian Senior Center development that where we had like $4 million in permitting revenue, the um, transfer back to the general fund from the stormwater plan that was, was only planned during the upcoming budget cycle. Oftentimes, unrealized gains and gains from investment income is something that we don't forecast out into the future. Um, and those have to be accounted for according to their accounting regu regulations. Uh, the other items are um, expenses. So when sometimes expenses are lower than expected, we noticed a lot of that during the pandemic where a lot of programs and other activities basically had to shut down. And so we had some savings with our expenses. Also, over the past couple of years, we've had very mild winters, so there's a significant cost savings there as far as um, the supplies such as gasoline, salt, overtime hours. Um, so some of those things are very difficult to project five years down the road, four years down the road, and so those, those will cause variances. So um, with that, and I think a lot of the items that kind of came to light since we've you know, set the proposed budget, we're gonna refine the five-year forecast a little bit more updated health insurance rates and um, some other things as we go. Um, so I, I will get, some of this is already listed in the budget book, but just to go over um, some of the assumptions that we did make. Um, the real property taxes are estimated to increase by 3% annually starting in FY26. So in FY25, we are currently showing an increase of 6% for real property taxes. With the commercial uh, kind of unsettledness right now, we are holding that 3% instead of trying to overestimate. Um, the income tax growth was, is also estimated at 4% annually. And as we've gotten additional income taxes in in the past couple of months, we're gonna take another look in that, see if 4% is still accurate or if that needs to be revised. Uh, we've modified some of the licensing and permitting fee revenues since last year. The rental housing licenses were adjusted to talk, to account for those biannual swings that Tanisha mentioned, and also increase the building permit revenue for next year for some of the projects that we have coming up, and then that will going forward will increase at two percent per year. The hotel and motel revenue and emissions and amusement revenue. So we're still seeing that coming back from the pandemic. So for FY25, there's an increase of 11% over the FY24 budget and a 5% increase in FY26. Then after that, we expect it to level off and be a consistent 2% per year. Janice, you mentioned that you that we have been underestimating our revenue uh, since FY19. Um, and if we're only looking at I mean, 2% increase in real property tax, just what we know is gonna be phased in over the next three years. That seems awfully low. So it's 3%. Oh, so. Oh, where does it say? It's maybe my fault. Oh. <laughs> it says Even two. three I'm is, sorry. pretty conservative. <laughs> it is low, and I think if it wasn't for some of the, I can't think of the word, I'm, <laughs> the concern with the vacancies within all yeah. the commercial buildings, which I mean, again, yeah. there's, we don't think all 2.2 million will come to fruition, but there's 2.2 million in revenue at risk uh, mm -hmm. with the appeals that have been filed currently, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to wait for the dust to settle on that and then we can make refinements in the future. But I think I have our, uh, our real estate trend line, and it's not it's not that far uh, ahead of 3%. I mean, I think, again, we made some adjustments. It was lower um, in the past. So when she says from FY19, um, and then she you might have missed that she said, we made adjustments to how we do our assumptions for FY23 is when we going began. forward. So we made we we refined those, right? Mostly out of lots of discussions with Neil and challenging those things and so we took another <laughs> look. Um, but there are some there's some things that we just, you know, really can't account for um, that happen that make these swings happen, but there was no way we would have known that that would have happened. Um, so I think the changes we've made 
uh, for FY23, you, you saw on this slide before, you know, that you can see those lines um, trending, tracking pretty closely to each other. So we think we're doing well there, but we've only had this in place for one full budget year. So we kind of need some time, you know, a couple more years to ascertain whether the assumption changes we made have improved the reliability of the forecast, you know, not counting sort of one-time things that happen that we can't necessarily control for. I have a question about the real estate tax. What proportion of the revenue comes from residential versus commercial? So I just asked that earlier today, and so it's 30, 35% of the assessments is for can you, commercial. Can you say that again? 35%. Is, is, is it's commercial. commercial. Yeah. So because of the residential real estate valuations mm -hmm. are going up like crazy because of the shortages and things like that. Right. And because again, that's Jamil's house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Singly. And, <laughs> and those are capped at 10% per year as right. well. But so 10% a year is not insubstantial. Right. And that, that's not all the houses yeah. as well. So, I mean, there, so there's a cap of the 10% and then we get a fraction of that, uh, of those assessments. So, so. Follow up on that. Is there ever a thought to, Earlier we talked about um, October is the slug, the, the majority of the payment. It, does that go back to last year's payments are paid in this October or it's this new that's, assessment? That's the bills that will be issued in July of this year. In July. So is there ever a thought to have like some contingency built in? Because in October, you'll see how far off or on you were on this. And if real estate revenues come in way above that, is there ever a thought to have contingent expenditures that are not, you know, they're not going to get expended, but for revenues coming at these, at these different tiers? That's something that I think we haven't considered in the past. Contingent but. expenditures? I think they call that a wish list. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That's triggered by the higher than anticipated, you know. You could also have the reverse, which is not as nice, where yeah, if I they mean, come in lower, you have to, you know, Right. So, and generally with our real estate taxes for the upcoming year, it's not too far off. It, we have a pretty good idea of that upcoming year. It's, those, it's that longer range forecast okay. where it's a little trickier. So could I make a suggestion which you can cheerfully ignore <laughs> as with all my suggestions? Uh, it's an option. It's not a mandatory. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll assume that okay. wasn't what? Is everybody all right? <laughs> Shelly is not okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. anyway, the, um, the, the, the difficult thing that you expressed in terms of forecasting is the one-time expenses and revenue. Um, but going back historically, we should be able to look at revenue, one-time revenue and expenses per year and see what range is re is reasonable you know there might be an average of two million dollars between anywhere between one and three i'm just pulling numbers out of thin air and bake those in because as you know i've really taken a good hard look at these five-year forecasts and they've been especially when you look at the five year one to year five it's been you know it always slants downward in the projection and the reality is that it tends to go upward instead because we seem to be profitable every year so maybe that should be baked in. You don't need to respond. Yeah. Just something that I wanted to throw out on the table as something like a fudge factor you could build in. To make like the it. error bars on the chart in terms of the plus minus. Yeah, somewhere a range of what you what you yeah. re, what's a reasonable. Janice, let me ask you this question: Does GASB uh, rules regulations dictate in any way how we project five years in the future? Are there are there uh, government standards for that? Not that I'm aware okay. of. No, and, and particularly for a pay-as-you-go community. I mean, there's no, there's nothing that says we have to do even this five-year forecast, mm -hmm. but I think... You just do it to irritate me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we do have to do the... Yeah. Well, can I ask a question on that? So, yeah. So. Um, we, don't, we don't do it to irritate you, but I, I wanted <laughs> to just quickly return to um, Jim's question. I think it was Jim. Um, about whether the 3% was too low. Mm. So when I look at actuals um, from 19 to 20, 4%. From 20 to 21, 3%. From 21 to 22, 2%. From 22 to 
from 22 to 23, four percent. We're not this. There's not a wild shift there, right? So I think three percent was fair. If it was two before, and we thought, okay, that's low, right? That's fair. That was a challenge um, from the council when we reviewed that. Two percent seemed low. We hadn't experienced that, though. We did from 21 to 22. The change in real estate uh, state taxes was two percent. So. I do think 3% is fair there. We, we continue to kick the tires on these things. Um, and to your point, Neil, about trying to factor in some portion of the one-time revenue, I mean, even when we, we try to isolate what that's been in the past, um, the nature of one-time revenue is just it's not, it's, it's difficult to project. So if we bake that into the forecast, um, you know, we have the we have the risk of painting a rosier picture. Obviously, if we're too conservative, then we're painting a, a scary picture. You've not seen, as you used to, this line dip below zero as it as it used to. So I do think that we've made some strides there in improving no on question. that. No question. The slope of the line has changed, but it's still <laughs> still going the wrong way. It's not below zero as it used to show, um, right. which was it was unreasonable to go below zero. But the target itself is something that, I mean, honestly, um, it's it's not an excuse. It's just a reason. I've been here since 2020, and the finance department has had some trans major transition almost every single year. Um, so for us to just you know keep keep everything running smoothly and get a budget out the door um, has been a challenge with a change of finance director and, and lots of vacancy in the department. We've gotten some stability now, and I think some of these projects that are on our list to tackle, like the target, um, so we're using a generic GFOA recommended target. There is no GFOA recommended target for a pay-as-you-go community. That's something that we need to evaluate and customize for ourselves. So, for example, right, we have some large projects coming online now. Um, but we know that every year there are capital projects that are annual programs. That should be factored in to sort of treat it like operational money because the money comes from the general fund. So every year we should make sure that we can cover all of our basic operations and all of our annual core programs in the, in the CIP. Projects over and above that, you know, are things that we pull from that we've saved and you see those fluctuations, but I think our target should take into account that we do have a capital program that relies on essentially operating money to fund. Um, so the 25% target actually may not be high enough for a, a debt-free community. So those are things we need to evaluate. It's been on our list. We don't, we haven't had time to do it, but it's certainly a priority. What we have tried to prioritize though is really, you know, taking a realistic look at the assumptions I think we've made some good tweaks there, and we'd like to see, you know, how they shake out over the next couple of years since we only have one year of performance. So two questions, if I could, and, and I know Councilmember Harris is much more ingrained in the budget than I am over time, but my sense of our conversations over time has been we had historically um, been wildly inaccurate on projections versus actuals, which is what resulted in a, a very high rainy day fund. And we had the conversation about kind of tightening the shot group, um, spending down to a 25% rainy day fund. Whoa. Is, no, I, I don't thought think we ever had that conversation. Spending down yeah, to I, it. I don't remember saying that. So we had a yeah, conversation, that's... I think it was 17 and 18, um, a, a, about, because I think we were at upwards of 80 or 90 million in our rainy day fund, which is, as a percentage of our, our, our budget, is significantly higher than others jurisdictions um, and the cause of that I thought was because we would project expenses and revenue that that didn't marry up with actual so all the time we thought the slope would go down but it would keep going up um, it, is our are our projections marrying up with with our actuals now better than they had in the past and then the second question is um, we, we mentioned the Carnegie, for example, as a, 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 a non-reoccurring expenses or revenue. Do those, shouldn't those tie with non-reoccurring expenses as well? So my thought was that permits come, 
we charge permitting fees as a surrogate for services that are rendered that, that are associated with those projects. You know, we have to bring in folks to do design reviews and things like that. That's what I thought those permit fees were for. So am I thinking about it wrong that, yeah, we're realizing a, a one-time revenue add because of those projects, but we should also have a commensurate expense add that goes along with that revenue because it's, it's a one-time uh, payment for expenses that should be incurred for those projects. Okay. Or are we just are I we just charging so, fees that are no see there's there's a few commingled things in your questions I two questions <laughs> on back. um there are a few commingled things i'm going to try to um uh, separate the things that need to be separated so one jen is rightfully so said if you take a look at our history even before fy19 you're going to see larger variances between actual expenses and revenue. Um, some of those things are things that couldn't have been accounted for, couldn't have been planned for. Um, so you, you know, you you can't. We we didn't. We don't know if we're going to get the million dollar grant um, that then reduces our expenses, right? We don't know if we're going to um, have a permit come in, in in one year when we were expecting it to be the next year. There are things that we just can't project. Um, so you've seen that, but I think also the assumptions around the five-year forecast were, were very conservative. And I can't speak for previous administrations, but my, my suspicion is as a debt-free community, being more conservative in those projections actually works to serve us continuing as a debt-free community. You asked about the permit example for the Carnegie. Um, there's a there's a couple of things you wrapped up in there so it's it's going to be treated as non-recurring revenue because you're not going to receive a per that permit every year right that's not something you can reasonably count on but also it was realized sooner than it was anticipated so you know as we tried our best to project when they would be coming in to actually break ground and start the, the building process which was when you pull permits that happened several months sooner in, in that fiscal year we weren't expecting that, right? So there was no way we could have planned for that revenue we were anticipating it to be in the next fiscal year. Yes, we use the revenue to cover external costs that we need um, for consulting and other things to supplement our service on large projects that need additional design review, plan review, and those sorts of things. So, Okay, so, so yeah, so there's... Yeah. The, there has to be some correlation, I would assume, between the, the, the permitting fees and the services that are rendered for those. So I, I just want to make sure we don't have an expense bubble trailing the revenue bubble that we're going to have to suddenly account for. But I, I would expect they all occur within the same. The other thing you got to take in mind that the revenue comes in in one year, but the expense might be spread over two or three years in terms of the permit costs, in terms of staff time or outside consulting time. Yeah. I mean, think how long it's taken Carnegie to start from when they applied for the permit, paid for the permit, and they're just getting ready to open, right? So always make sure you're taking yep. that into account in terms of that one-time revenue. Yep. The expense is actually spread over That's much the trailing longer. expense bubble that I was just yep. mentioning. Are, are we, you know, just want to make sure we're, I hear bumps in revenue, um, you see the, the, the that number go up, but there should be trailing expenses, as Dennis had just said, that I think we need to. Yeah, and I thank you for pointing that out, Dennis, but also, so the I think the main point that I wanted to get across that might have, um, it may have not been clear, is in that case, what we wouldn't want to do is say, oh, we've got an extra $4 million in, in revenue, we're going to hire yep. four staff members, right, right going right. forward. That's not a good right. plan, right? Yeah. But if we're going to need additional consulting, we can handle that because that's going to be a one-time expense. It might reoccur for a couple of years, but it's technically still a one-time expense. It's not as hiring staff that we're going to keep on with us through retirement and then need other OPEP yeah. uh, funds. But I mean, even on this entire conversation, it's better to have 80 million in the bank than 80 million in debt. And so we're. Well, and that, I think that's the stance this community is taking, right? So, yes, our balance is much higher than in other communities, but all of those other communities have debt. We do not carry debt. Um, 
and one of the one of the other projects we just haven't made had time to make a lot of progress on but is still at the top of our list is is getting a better handle on everything that's projected for us we talked about um, our aging infrastructure as a community last week that you know Gaithersburg isn't a spring chicken anymore and, and some of these things are going to need maintenance and repair in ways that we've not had to plan for. Um, so I, I think our reserve is healthy and I would refrain really I wouldn't call it a rainy day fund because you know communities that have that states that have that also are carrying debt and doing other things they're not paying cash you know for a 20 million dollar new police station. Um, but that's something that we're able to do because we've made a commitment to remain debt free. So we, we just have to keep those things in mind. So we would never recommend spending down to the 25%. I actually think the 25% target for us is too low given our goal to remain debt free. Um, but the variances um, do over time, right, accumulate and, and create this larger balance but that's not the, re we're not trying to create a variance there. Um, that's why we actually budget for the transfers that we wanna make. We're not relying on there to be some windfall that we then have to maybe build, you know, fix a, fix a stormwater pipe or something like that in the future. Um, so I hope, I hope that makes sense. Um, I know we have a lot of vigorous discussion on the, on the five-year forecast, I think maybe having two years, three years of data, so the FY26 budget perhaps, or 27 budget, will really demonstrate whether um, those tweaks we've made to the assumptions are, are paying off. But certainly we aren't seeing the dips below zero, which I think were problematic. Uh, so I, I'm really glad to hear you saying that you're, you plan to look at the 25% the target, because I, I would agree if, if Carrying all of these fund balances is something that you know we want to be doing replacement and stormwater and CIP and all of those things that we know need to come out of these. Um, I would be curious to see what other pay-as-you-go cities have done. You know, is there a best practice out there? Um, and I think from from my standpoint, and, and I may or may not speak for my colleagues, you know, just getting a little more certainty, for lack of uh, as much as you can get in a projection, right? Um, for us to understand, knowing all of these different priorities and, and as you said, infrastructure needs and, and things that are coming down the pipeline, you know, we've we've not raised taxes more than once in 60 years, and we definitely want to keep that. So I think the more um, the more data that we have from these projections that allow us to see, well, how are those balances going? Do we need to start thinking about putting more in every year? Those kinds of decisions. Um, the, the more clarity we have to the to the horizon, I think, is going to make us more comfortable each year as we're determining how much. Yes, we need to. We're, we're good with this number going into the transfer into your non-departmental department. Um, I think that just gives us more um, more more uh, clarity and, and and lets us breathe a little easier, knowing that that we're not going to have that bubble in the future. Like, oh yeah, we we really wanted to have $50 million available because of X, you know. Um, we don't have that right now, but we could. <coughs> so um, I appreciate that. Do you think that that's something on the table for this time next year? Is that something we're hopefully having in the the, 20, the FY26 conversation, or? You mean having a better handle on all the future infrastructure on the per, On the percentage the... that you think we should be using as our target. Oh, the target. <coughs> I, yes. OK. So just to pick, pick and back, uh, I think one thing, I agree with everything you said, um, be helpful in these projections when you look at the historical ones, what your error bars are, right? So there's a band there, so is it plus minus 10%, 5%? So in terms of adding more certainty, you know that, hey, over the last 15 years, 10 years, yes, there's always one-offs, but over a 10-year, 15-year period, they kind of offset each other in terms of puts and takes. And that, and managing that error bar gives you like, okay, within this band, we're pretty, you know, we have a 95% confidence interval that we're going to be there. It's not going to be, unless there's another worldwide pandemic, which we can't anticipate. But there was also external or exogenous money that came in that we didn't anticipate. But having that error bar, I think it's very helpful uh, to, to look at that. 
but it sounds like also there's a point in time going back historically that may not make sense if we were looking at revenue uh, property tax projections under zero does it does it make sense to go back that far and, and trend against those numbers it, is there a point in time and and maybe it's not I don't know if it's enough time I th we're is 19 a good year to start it, is go 17 a good year to start historically I think at some point it doesn't make sense because the numbers maybe weren't realistic well I think when we look at plot the numbers you know we can figure out what that line should be and Janice and I talked a little bit earlier today but you know haven't had a lot of time to revisit the conversation about how we might um, plot the variance reflect that variance I think we have a chart actually I have the numbers. They're not on a chart yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have the numbers. So, having, but having I think we've these. shared a chart with Neil in the past. <laughs> yeah. so, having so look having, having looked at these forecasts yeah. for a long time, I, I, I like to agree with the point that you made that the assumptions changed just a couple of years ago and you don't have enough time to right. Right. really We have new methodology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. but right. Let it see. Let's see how it works. And I'm tired of looking at the same slide on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> what about that one? Did we get through this? Are we good to go? Yes. I mean, obviously, I have more some questions, but I'm sure nobody else yeah. wants to hear them at this okay. point. I mean, the big one that jumps out there is, you know, our health insurance assumption. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just going forward, we might have to adjust that, but we'll yeah. we'll get more information next week. One, um, I've seen over the years the conduit revenue, uh, conduit bonds that are issued. Um, city used to do it for free, then it charged a nominal fee. As it, as sort of interest rates are as where they are now, that provides a potential source of funding for the city, right? In terms of issuing them, is Asbury like the only recipient of them? Have we ever advertised that for other potential uh, entities that could avail themselves of that, and what revenue that could generate? They are the only recipient, and then yeah. Because they're only aware of it, or are there no more entities that could qualify I for that? I think there's a narrow uh, definition of who qualifies. Okay. Um, there could be other nonprofits in the community that could qualify, maybe. It doesn't actually but provide us with revenue, right? Isn't it? Yeah. We, well, for, a little fee. The yeah. first, t the the last yeah. issuance, we did charge a small fee. It was it was a nominal fee. Um, right. Just to cover our administrative costs. We have to raise the fee a lot to make it meaningful yeah. budget wise. Yeah. Which and doesn't make it meaningful for the nonprofit, right? So there's and it's only nonprofits there. that can get only it. Only nonprofits yes. are eligible for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and I not every nonprofit. Yeah. There are actually some I parameters around well. the nonprofit. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, other questions on the five-year forecast? Joe's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to ask this? <laughs> I'm cutting up the baby. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch out and let Dennis come up to shift the stormwater fund and capital improvements. Uh, we're still good, Mayor. You, you yeah, know? yeah, let's okay. go. All right. We got to get through it. <laughs> Everybody's watching the game. You could use the gong whenever you like. <laughs> Don't no one say the score. I'm DVRing the game, please. Okay, don't say the score. Is it football score. or it's college? Yes, it's football. <laughs> the football you're throwing the hoop. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. As Tanisha noted, I'm going to try to cover the stormwater fund and the capital improvement program. Um, the stormwater fund was created in uh, FY16, um, and again, this fund is meant to operate as close as we can to an enterprise fund. Uh, what that means is the revenue we take in uh, allows us to cover the expenses related to the stormwater. Uh, we have changed um, the stormwater fund over time. Uh, originally, when we started out in FY 2016, uh, because it was a new fund, we started with a certain rate. So we could not cover all the costs that were directly contributed to the stormwater. Um, so, for instance, a number of the salaries and other things uh, were not included in those original rates. So as we have moved forward from 2016, we have tried to take that enterprise approach. And so you'll hear me make some comments again about kind of the final stage of some of the projects that we used to have in the CIP transferring. Uh, we did reevaluate the program in FY21 um, and did um, some cost analysis, data rate modeling, um, and that recommendations were presented to the council 
and we adopted a rate model for FY22 through 27. Um, at that time, the rate um, for each billable unit, which is uh, 500 square feet of impervious surface, was 32.28. Um, that billable rate has stayed the same and will stay the same for the FY25 um, program. I will note that we've expanded uh, the program slightly, but we believe we can cover those costs um, in an enterprise fashion for the HOA um, takeover facilities that we've talked about um, that we will be trying to implement over time. I'll note that the um, employee has stayed the same. Um, just like IT, we've had a number of um, job title changes and a little bit uh, reconfiguration of those jobs. Some of that has to do with trying to be um, in the market, right? Um, what people call terms and what people do for their positions. Um, we often have to, especially IT is a good example and Stormwater is another one where we have to reflect the current trends in hiring. So that's why you'll see some of those numbers move back and forth on the FTEs, um, but there's really no increase. We are seeing a 5% um, increase in the overall operations budget, which is $345,000. Um, those are really related to reduction in general operating supplies and contributions. Um, at one time, we were looking at trying to do purchase of stormwater credits um, through other agencies. We found that we can meet the criteria that we need to meet uh, with the projects that we have in terms of the number of credits that MDE, uh, Maryland Department of Environment, requires us to meet under our permit. Um, so we reduced that. We have seen an increase in miscellaneous service and, and contractual maintenance. As you know, and Tanisha pointed out, a lot of our infrastructure is aging, um, so we're seeing more uh, maintenance needs and we're trying to address those on a regular basis. <clears throat> and then one of the other uh, kind of big things, uh, we've finalized moving all the culvert and bridge projects from the regular CIP to the stormwater CIP. And some of those are like rabbit road um, culvert repair. Again, these are really stormwater projects. Originally, they were funded under the regular CIP, and so we've moved um, six projects uh, this year. I will note that um, giving staffing changes that we've had in the department, I'll talk about that a little bit later, a number of these are actually behind schedule. Um, so we've moved six of them from the regular CIP to the stormwater CIP, and that's roughly about $1.5 million um, going from one um, of the funds to the other funds. One of the other things I wanted to talk about um, tonight is that we have a number of projects that are long-term projects. Um, on the stormwater CIP, we actually project out seven years, um, partly because of the way the permit process works. Technically, we have a five-year permit with MDE, uh, Maryland Department of the Environment. Somehow those turn into seven-year permits because they don't get their permit process worked out. We're actually due to do a renewal. Um, we have not seen the criteria yet for the renewal for the permit. Um, so we do a number of projects like the headwater study, which is um, the last of our 740-acre um, study for the heart of the city that looks at the watershed that drains into that portion of the area. Um, this is a pretty big project for us, and it's taken a little bit of time. Um, as noted earlier, if you look at the project page, um, we have done some outreach to the community um, that was done in June of last year and we're working on some of the um, different types of infrastructure that we will need to in install uh, related to this stormwater study uh, for the central core. It's going to be a little bit different than what we would see regularly for um, some of the other stormwater projects because we don't have a lot of green space land, right? Um, we're going to have to look at other techniques. I will note that it's really come of age now. So when I started back in um, 2013, um, we did a lot of the stormwater um, shed studies. We're back again looking at all of those uh, watershed studies again. So that's in the CIP, if you'll note, um, for all the rest of our um, Muddy Branch, Lower Great Seneca, um, Middle Great Seneca Creek. Um, those are all started to begin in 2024 and will be completed in 2026. It will help us kind of identify other projects and how we're going to meet our requirements under the MDE um, permit. I also wanted to note that um, for some of these projects we have long-term kind of evaluation processes 
Uh, this is the solitaire stream improvements um, that we've done. Uh, we're actually in the third year, second year, third year of evaluation. So uh, this is a before picture. Uh, this was prior to planning during construction. And this is actually um, two years out. Um, so you can see the improvement. We have had a lot of uh, constructive comment about these projects uh, related to the community. So we're really wanting to make sure that they're meeting their end goal, uh, which is one, to meet the stormwater credits, but also to improve water quality. Um, so staff has done a really good job. Um, some of the things that people don't think about that we have to really look at when we do these projects is creating a non-native invasion invasive eradication plan because um, just as we all know birds travel seeds and other things travel seeds um, so we have to work on those and then we also have to look at how this is doing over a five-year period according to the MDE requirements and if there are any issues um, that didn't work out with those we work through those uh, with MDE it's staffing I challenges. Say, Dennis it's really nice to see that image of solitaire. I was going to say that too. I, <laughs> I haven't seen that it's yet. Really nice. yeah. And all of the consternation that we heard about the, you know, that the before prior to planting and understanding it was barren to see it rebound like that the way it was planned to. It's I don't just, want to put that out there. I right? absolutely yeah. want to. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. Yeah. And, it's and on the project page. So fantastic. Okay, great. Do, do you know if the, you know, there was some testimony or comments from the public at the time that the the project affected fauna, you know, there, and now that's sort of re-green, do you know if that's reset or, you know? We haven't done the analysis on that, but my guess is yes, we have had wildlife come back um, to the area um, to the extent um, we haven't done any um, study on that particular item. There's a nice walking path back there. Hmm. There is. I will note, um, you know, we have had staffing challenges. That's why a number of the projects have been behind. Um, this is the current staff. We are two members shy still um, in the stormwater staff, um, one of them being the sustainability coordinator um, or position. And um, that's a little bit separate outside of the stormwater fund. Um, it's funded by the general fund because the activity isn't supported um, by stormwater per se. Um, so it actually has a different uh, 1134. If you're looking at the budget, that's where those fundings come from. Um, out of all these people, these are all new people since I've been here. Um, again, if you're a stormwater engineer, it's a great place to be in terms of maneuverability in the market, and that's been a, a challenge for us. I think we have a great team going forward. Um, a number of the projects you'll see um, in the CIP, like Lake Kirsten repairs, Lake Placid repairs, um, a lot of these are in the Ketlands area, uh, Walder Park uh, drainage design repair, um, those are a few of the ones that have been um, kind of delayed because of the staffing that we have. Again, we have a great staffing. Some of the other things you're going to be seeing um, in the coming uh, months and year uh, from the stormwater group is we'll need to address um, Chapter 8, which is the stormwater ordinance. Uh, they'll be working on those, partly to look at the HOA regulation facilities, uh, but also just to update some of the regulations based upon uh, FEMA standards and the new floodplain maps. So if you throw a slide up there saying staffing challenges, it begs the what are we doing about it question. I think we're doing a, a really good job of making sure we have a hybrid environment uh, for the workforce, for those that can. Not all of them can. You know, if we have an inspector, the inspector pretty much has to be here um, five days a week with the exception of some special projects. I think we've done a great job from the HR standpoint that we reevaluate re um, salaries on a yearly basis. We do an analysis for pretty much the entire city. We also do a really good job of doing cost analysis when we have vacancies um, too, and making sure that we're bringing parity to those individuals who are currently employed um, at the city level. So we're doing all of those things to try to keep people uh, on target. So. And hopefully soon, they'll be in nice digs mm -hmm. at 12 South Summit instead of portable. Yeah, and, that, and we're trying Soon. to. Sue. <laughs> I'll talk about Sue's that. carrying out of weight. <laughs> I think um, the mayor and council are familiar with the CIP, which is a capital improvement plan. It's actually divided into um, a number of different categories um, that we have. Again, this is to 
maintain the existing infrastructure we have. Um, a counter to this is the asset replacement. So some things do come out of the asset replacement fund, a lot of the playground equipment, um, things like that. So we have general capital. Um, this aspect is for an account savings account to some degree or for new assets. So for getting new assets is where a lot of the money comes out of. Um, for instance, um, Pleasant View Park um, is listed in this category, 16 South Summit, uh, 12 South Summit, because those are all new assets. They're not replacement assets. Infrastructure um, fund is the fund that we use to account for savings and spending on infrastructure assets, including um, roads, sidewalks, streets, lighting, bridges, um, and other special projects related to that. Facilities, of course, are City Hall, the parks facilities, um, the police department, um, public works. Parks, we use it for the parks, the water park, um, and some of their activities too. And then technology is the account that we use for hardware and software projects initiatives uh, for new um, buildings, but also for retrofit of existing buildings. Um, we're using more cameras, we're using more security control, and you'll see those reflected in there. And then the final category is art in public places, uh, which we use to do uh, public art um, with some of our projects, uh, but also when developers uh, provide us a certain percentage of money um, for those. Um, some of the highlights for the CIP, uh, we continue to develop a CIP prioritization process for the projects. We have a, a staff team that goes and ranks the projects um, based upon uh, uh, different criteria. Um, I'll go through the rest of these um, that we talked about. I've already kind of hit a point about the, the phase five LED um, street lights, which is the last, and Tanisha noted that the savings were doing that, and I've already noted the grants that we're getting um, with that. I think one of the things we're most excited about is 16 South Summit. We have um, achieved substantial completion as of March 27th. We are working with the um, contractor to turn over that facility um, to the city. The city already has the outbuilding and we've had that since August. Um, we've been using that to retrofit a number of the police vehicles. Um, that has been really helpful and we've recently just taken the site. We're just working through the final paperwork for acceptance of the building. I will note that the police department is working on a, a move-in plan um, and we'll need to continue to finish the audio-visual component of this project. Um, that was not awarded to the current general contractor. That is awarded to Washington Professional Services in a separate contract. Um, we thought they were going to start this week, but they have a big federal contract, so they pushed it back a week. They have been doing work as um, they've been allowed um, with what was working construction in 16. Um, we are hopeful that this work will be completed in time to have um, a meeting of the mayor and council before the August recess. I don't want to commit to a date yet. I think once um, WPS or uh, Washington Professional Services comes back to the site, we'll have a better idea of the schedule and I'll update um, the council on that. Are we going to cut a ribbon with really big scissors? We will cut notes? a ribbon at, at some point. Um, I will also note, you know, I've tried to, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the funding that comes in that we don't always know that's going to come in. Uh, this project in particular, um, you know, we received two million direct um, funding from the state uh, for this project. So that's one of those uh, one-time revenue sources um, that we've seen. I also wanted to point out a related project to this was the fiber duct bank, which really connects uh, the city facilities with an old town and we've planned enough to um, allow 12 to also do this. Um, so we have the Old Town Complex, which is basically 16 South Summit, the concert pavilion, and the parking garage, and then those all tie back into um, City Hall. So that was a side project as part of that. Another project I will be happy when it's completed is <laughs> Pleasant View Park. Um, we have had run into some weather delays. Um, it's really clay soil out there. Um, and there's a long entrance road, uh, unlike some of the other parks that we have that are directly adjacent to existing streets. We are basically building a street to the park um, from Darnstown Road, and we've run into some complications uh, with that project related to the rain. 
Um, so we appreciate the community. I was just out there today talking to one of the neighbors and thank them for their appreciation for um, some of the delays that have occurred and, uh, and they're just ready for it to be open. We will um, update council once the road construction starts. Um, I'm hopeful they'll get a little bit done this week, but I'm, I'm not sure they'll make it far enough along because there's rain anticipated on Thursday again. So it just depends on how much we will have. I'll also point out in, in this particular project, there's uh, 2.1 million um, in POS money, which is public open space money that comes through the state, um, through um, Montgomery County. And then we received 450,000 in Bonville uh, money related to this project. So I think one of the things that you're seeing on the revenue side is that staff's doing a really good job at getting grants and bond bills and other funding sources as we move forward because we've made that commitment um, to the council. One other thing is that you can't even budget of the revenue for the project. Yeah, so that's something that historically probably impacted the five-year forecast as well where we had we funded all of the CIP directly from the general fund and any of these bond bills or other grants that we received that would come into the general fund. And so the timing of those were always sometimes dependent on the <laughs> completion of the project, which you know, we, we know it can't, doesn't always happen on time. Um, so, so now I think, was that FY23 or 22? Yes. We started budgeting for the CIP revenues within the CIP fund. So you will see in the CIP where there's state grants, different bond bills coming in to the projects directly instead of creating those fluctuations within the general fund. So. Also within the Pleasant View Park um, for the community gardens, it, will there be an offset of ex expenses and revenue based on the fees that we're charging for the uh, community gardens to apply for a community garden versus maintaining those gardens. Yeah, it would be unlikely they are going to break even. No, no, I don't think we're going to. There will be some offset, but it's just a minor application fee. Um, I'd have to check with Parks on what they set that application fee to be. 20. Um, but it's not It's not going to cover any of the lot. real costs associated with it. It's trying to get a commitment for that person to maintain their plot okay. over the year, right? Um, if you put zero dollars on it, uh, for those of us who do community garden, um, I have a community garden plot myself um, that if you put zero dollars on it, they're less likely to maintain it than sure. if you put 20 or uh, 30 dollars um, over the long haul. We want them to use the community garden and not just start off in the spring, plant a few things, and then let it go um, over the summer. But will there be maintenance responsibility for the city for yes. those gardens? There will be. There will be mulch that will be required. Um, we'll end up buying some initial tools. I think the hope is. Um, that we can get it to a point that the organization or the group of people who are um, renting the plots actually run the program. Okay. Um, those are the ones that are most successful. So they may actually um, come to the city and ask for the fee to be increased based on what they want to do. Okay. Thank you. And aside from you know the projects that we all see as the signature projects, uh, we do a lot of other smaller projects, and here's some e examples. Uh, Wells Robertson House, um, along with City Hall, got some siding replacement. Uh, this is the pond at the miniature golf course, uh, which we did a, a, a cost-benefit analysis that used to have a, a rubber liner in it, and we moved to um, a permanent liner in terms of uh, the concrete, um, and that will be uh, finished um, this year. In fact, um, Wells is about done, and so is uh, the pond. Um, but I also want to make sure that we talk about one of the bigger expenditures that we have that's really annual maintenance, right? It's, it's the sidewalk um, replacement that we have. It's the asphalt um, program that we have for streets. Um, and then it's the replacement of curb and gutter. Um, we roughly spend um, just over $2 million for those projects every year. Uh, we do that through a very... Um, detailed analysis of what the streets look like and do some radar in terms of um, every few years we drive over all the streets they check where the holes might be and then we develop a, a plan that includes um, not just street reconstruction but mill and overlay and micro surfacing uh, to try to extend uh, the program and as Tanisha pointed out I think um, some of the fund balance you'll see us probably need to increase that um, as our streets begin to age, right? We have, we have a lot that were built in the 80s 
90s, 2000s, um, and a street typically has about a 25-year life. Um, we do a really good job of trying to um, do what I call meet the curve, um, that we try to do interjections of street maintenance before we get on the downside curve of the maintenance side. So we try to do preventative maintenance early on um, in that bell curve um, to make our streets last longer than 25 years, and we've been really successful um, at that. So next, I'm going to talk about the new projects. Um, so one of the new projects that we've all been talking about is 812 South Summit. Um, this was the acquisition of this um, building along with the adjacent um, parcel um, that's there. Um, it's to meet the future needs of administrative offices and services. Um, that project is, was actually a mid-year ad um, for the purchase of the property. Um, so that project will last between uh, the fiscal years 24 and 27. We are just getting um, started uh, with those. Um, as we've noted in other discussions uh, with the council, uh, this is our opportunity to consolidate some of the front-facing um, components that we have um, related to the development process. Um, so Stormwater Group, the engineering group, um, who are currently in the public works facility over on Rabbit Road, uh, will be relocated to this location. Um, in addition, uh, you know, we are always looking at ways that we can more effectively use the community's money. Um, I think a number of you have been on where we've talked about the study. If we didn't um, acquire this parcel and property, that we would need to do a pretty significant addition um, to the public works facility. With the relocation of those um, divisions, uh, we will not need to do a, a full um, addition component. We'll be able to do more remodeling. We haven't set what that tone would be because we don't know how to use that space yet, um, but that will be a, a better cost-benefit analysis and I think ultimately result in uh, better services to the community because there will be more of a one-stop shop um, with that. In addition, to be honest, we've been looking at whether um, some components of park and rec um, primary staff um, you know, not associated with the activity center might also be located in this location, partly to free up additional space. Um, and when we look at the multi-generational, we'll be looking at, at those types of things of whether that might be a practical solution rather than building a whole new building. But um, those are just some of the things that we'll consider uh, with the- Hey Dennis, um, on eight and 12, and I apologize for the question because I asked you already, but I'm gonna ask you again. Um, is there going to be an opportunity for council to speak on or talk about any enhancements? You know, you talk maybe like a bridge between the two buildings, retail on the first floor, or are those things off the table? I mean, I think retail, you and I have talked about the retail, <laughs> that it's a difficult building to do retail. It's actually a difficult building from my perspective to create um, a logical entrance. Um, you know, the entrance doesn't face where um, you would think it would normally face. I think we're going to need to make improvements to 8, which is the outlot, to make that work a little bit better. But trying to do retail for that building because of the way it sits on the side that you would want the retail to be, which is Old Town, it's already a store, half story up. Um, so you, you can't deal with the ADA very well. We're actually exploring whether we could actually put a secondary entrance um, at the corner just across from 16, and that's probably even going to be difficult given the structure of the building. Um, in terms of the bridge, that's come up every now and then. I think we would look at it. I think it will come down to cost. Um, that would not be a cheap endeavor, um, just given the height. Um, but we will look at those options. We'll explore um, the overall design. Typically what we do for these types of um, projects, just like we did to the police station, we'll have a core representation from the departments that are moving, so they'll be part of the design team as we move through the whole project. Um, just like we have for 16, uh, the design team from the police department, IT, um, they all moved with the project. Um, and so we have a pretty cohesive idea of what was originally designed and how it gets built um, through that. So if you have other ideas, I think we could look at those. Um, I know that we probably would not be able to do solar on this particular project because of how the roof structure is in terms of the parapets and then the amount of mechanical equipment 
um, that's currently on the roof. I, you know, the cost for what you guys might seem high, but you have to realize the age of this building, almost all of the major infrastructure improvements in terms of HVAC, the mechanical systems, those all are at the point they have to be replaced. Mm -hmm. um, even the windows will probably have a big discussion about that because they don't meet the current energy code and what's the best solution uh, for those. Thank you. And then I'm gonna group all the other projects into m multiple slides. Um, another downtown project that we have is a traffic signal at South Summit and Old Town Road. We do have... <laughs> We do have some traffic issues at that particular um, point in time, um, so we have budgeted money uh, for that to occur. Um, we are studying not just that intersection, but how it links all together um, with from 355 all the way past the railroad tracks, because um, they're all interconnected. In addition, we'll be adding a project for Washingtonian Boulevard um, pedestrian improvements. Um, these kind of came about as we were designing the multi-use path. Um, staff took an analysis of some improvements that wouldn't be um, huge dollar costs um, that we can make to make it a little bit more walkable along that corridor. The Old Town Washington Grove uh, shared use path. This is a new project in a sense. It's actually been in the CIP previously and uh, was removed when we did some prioritization of the bicycle ped pass. I would say that we're reevaluating that again based upon what we're seeing the need to be, um, but also given the amount of money that we have um, set aside in a sense uh, for the bicycle ped pass. Uh, again, we're trying to use uh, transportation dollars that are uh, collected at the county level that are funds that are allocated um, to the city. Um, I have worked on this since I've been here and, and Jed knows this quite well. I think we'll hopefully be presenting a new memorandum of understanding uh, between the county and the city of how we can use those funds. Um, it would not be sufficient to do all the bicycle projects um, that we have. Um, so you'll note that we pushed out uh, Washingtonian um, because it's, it's costing a little bit more than we thought in terms of overall costs related to retaining walls and we think there are better priorities um, to do those multi-use paths. So you'll see some of those changes reflected um, in the overall CIP budget. Uh, Robertson Park Youth Center office conversion, um, we're actually taking kind of a storeroom and converting it to an office so they have a private space um, where they can have um, discussions um, in a more private setting because we don't have that currently at Robertson Park. Uh, b and train station uh, brick assessment. Um, so if you've been there, uh, one of the things um, that a lot of um, buildings happened when they were early um, recipients of preservation was sandblasting uh, the buildings, which was not really probably in the best interest of the building in the long term. So we're seeing a lot of decay at the base of the building where we have a lot of uh, water infiltration and so we'll be doing uh, repairs related to that. The activity center, RTU, HVAC, and again, that's the units that are on top of the roof um, that provide uh, cooling replacement. This is a long-term project. You'll notice it actually goes out to 2030, even though the CIP doesn't go out to 2030. This is a, a direct outgrowth of our facilities um, assessment studies that we've been doing over the past um, six years where we're going uh, methodically through each building and trying to assess um, not only the needs of the facility user, um, but also what the state of the current facility is and how old the HVAC unit is. Uh, this is, you know, a new approach for Gaithersburg. You know, we're trying to take a more proactive approach at planning these things rather than waiting for them to break down and then um, do them. Um, that's kind of the counter to having a, a, a reserve fund. Um, that we could do that, we think we need to be a little bit more logical in planning these out over the long haul. It was also mentioned earlier about EVs. Uh, one of the things that we have to do related to EVs is create the infrastructure, right? Um, so as Tony pointed out, we only have three chargers currently uh, behind the gate uh, for public works. And so we'll need to make some improvements, including probably some transformer improvements um, to allow for more EV vehicles 
come within there. One of the cost saving items that we're trying to look at that we did with 16 South Summit is we did not put water to the outbuilding. Um, we currently will be using the existing police station um, water um, to use their spigot, but long term, I think we'll be looking at what to do with that parcel and it may not be within the city's uh, realm of ownership um, anymore, or it may be used for a different use. And so we're going to um, try to put in a water line for 16 South Summit for the outbuilding to wash it out, um, things like that. It was a cost saving measure uh, we did in originally. There are a couple projects I wanted to bring to your attention that will have long-term additional costs associated with them. And I mentioned this one already before, the Public Works Green Roof Assessment. This is to look at the structural analysis of the roof. We do have some leaks in it. And then also we're going to conduct a solar analysis of whether it would be more cost uh, beneficial for the city to remove the green roof. There are you know, drawbacks to that. We actually get credits for the stormwater credits for having the green roof. Um, but the solar may be one of the better options um, in terms of that. Observation Park Historical Assessment. Um, this is to look at the uh, International Latitude Observatory um, building. Um, this is a historical asset. Um, these are not cheap assets to maintain. Um, and so there will be some cost implications that will show up in the CIP in future years um, to actually do the improvements. And this is to look at uh, the whole park, um, not just the observatory, but um, the major portions of the future costs will probably be related um, to maintenance of that historic facility. Um, we're coming on the 10 year anniversary of Lakeland's Park um, turf field. Um, they have about a 10 year life. Um, we are trying to push our slightly more um, past that. Um, I will point out that these are not cheap replacements. Um, right, they're roughly a million dollars um, to do the replacement itself. There will be a little cost savings uh, related to Lakeland's uh, park turf replacement because we have a proprietary infill. Um, we were one of the first adopters um, in Gaithersburg of organic fill. A lot of the fields that you'll see out there in other communities actually have kind of a, a rubber fill made from rubber tires. Uh, we chose not to do that. We did an organic fill, but it was one of the few um, on the market at the time, and it's a proprietary related to uh, the warranty on the field. We will see some cost savings by replacing the field and moving to what we have at the other two synthetic fields, uh, which are Robertson Park and Kelly. Hey, Dennis, on the roughly million dollar replacement, the future, we're talking about like the reserve budgeting for items like this and putting like a hundred grand for 10 years. Is that something being looked at? Yeah, that's been a, a big discussion. I yeah. mean, we are doing it. Um, that will be, um, you'll see that the CIP always has had future funding projects uh, because Gaithersburg is a pay-as-you-go. So we do put money in there um, when we know that we have expenditures coming up. So for Robertson Park, which is I think going on, I think it's two, or it might even be three years, um, we have put money aside, but we are going to start putting money aside for that and then also Kelly Park. Um, there's some question about whether, and, We've had some discussion about whether it's in the asset replacement fund or the CIP, and we're working through those, but I believe these are gonna be in the CIP because they're really large expenditures. Um, I, I would guess they're all gonna be in that range. I will note that we are getting more, I believe the bill's passed, more regulation on synthetic um, fields. We're gonna have to keep track of how much fill, infill we use. Um, at one time, the bill actually asked us to keep track of the amount of sand hmm. that we use. Um, but then also when we dispose of this field, we'll have to track it. We'll have to figure out where it went, did it get reused. Um, at this point, I don't believe the legislation included any requirements. It's mostly a tracking mechanism at this point. Um, but usually when those occur, I would anticipate that there'll be additional regulation about how recycling happens. So, so does it get budgeted like over the 10 year life or like at, at the last three years of its life? No, we're trying to do it over the 10 year life Okay, um, is what we're going to try to set up. Okay. And then um, one of the other projects which is kind of grant related is safe um, streets and roads for all. Uh, you can kind of think of this as the vision zero of Gaithersburg. I don't like to use that term because I think it's a misnomer that you'll ever get to zero. 
Um, so setting the community expectation here, we're gonna get there is, is really hard. Um, this is an engineering study, which consisted of uh, 360,000 in a federal grant and uh, funds uh, that the city contributed um, a 90 to make it 450. Again, this is gonna be our safety action plan. This will allow us to be eligible for other federal funding to actually do construction work. We have to have the safety plan in place and then based our other uh, federal initiatives uh, with that. I also want to, you know, I always try to spend a little bit of time of thanking staff um, for their efforts. Um, we have received a lot of grants lately. I mean, we've had a really good track record um, both at the federal level, um, at the state level, and then at the regional level uh, with COG. Um, some of the grants show up in the CIP and some of them don't. Um, some of the grants that don't show up are the transportation land use connections or the TLC program, which you guys recently um, saw the report for that. That was the Safe Routes to School study. Uh, that was directly funded through COG, so it doesn't show up uh, within our CIP. We have the Regional Roadway Safety Program, um, which is another 60,000 that sta uh, staff secured. That's not gonna show up in the CIP. It's kind of the forerunner to the project of the Safe uh, Streets and Roads. And then also um, Transit Within Reach, uh, which is funding the Old Town Bicycle Connection, which I talked about earlier. Um, that's an $85,000 grant um, with COG. We've received the, the federal funds, um, Tanisha noted, the million dollars just finally announced on, on Russell. Uh, the Activity Center gym floor, this session, we received $300,000 bond bill uh, for that project. Um, it's a $1.6 $5 million project. It's not a cheap project either. Uh, Walder Park we also received a $25,000 uh, bond bill uh, for that this session. Um, a couple grants that we have out there. Uh, we also have another uh, congressional direct spending um, grant um, in application for Blum Park trail improvements. Um, so we'll know all those take a longer time as we have seen with the Russell Avenue. And then we have another uh, couple of um, COG grants, the Regional Roadway Safety Program. And then we're also applying for a grant to help with the watershed studies um, from the Na uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. It's a small grant proposal for that. And with that, these are the people who actually do the, the projects, right? I, I help just coordinate. Um, these are the people who are on the ground uh, from engineering services, uh, from facilities, um, operations, um, Mark Scafidi's team, there are two people who do a lot of the projects that don't often show up in the CIP. A lot of the um, playground replacement, which are in the asset, asset replacement fund, um, Sean Steven does a lot of those. Those are great projects because we communicate with the community um, in helping pick the stuff and then also with Park and Rec. And then the stormwater group. I don't know if you guys have any questions before I move to the last. No, go ahead. The last slide is we would like to have public comment um, and is encouraged on the budget, but I think also important since we've rolled out this new budget software and it's all online, we would also like to see receive comments on the software itself and how people find um, going through the budget. And you know, in the past, it's always been a PDF, um, so it may have been harder to drill down. I think uh, the finance team's done an incredible job of creating the stories as they would call them, and you can drill down fairly easily and, and find um, that. You can send your comments to cityhall at gaithersburgmd.gov. Um, you can actually call us too, we'll answer the phone. Um, or you can email uh, us at 31 South Summit Avenue. Um, the goal and the budget will be on the agenda for adoption on Monday, May 6th of 2024. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> I feel like I'm listening to the GPS. Um, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of you, all staff. Thanks for your patience and for, for staying up late tonight with us. Um, this is this is one of the most important things we do. Um, it's exciting. Every, every year. <laughs> I agree it's exciting. I'm, he's had a lot more caffeine than I, so he's more convincing. Um, but, but thank you guys, really appreciate it. Um, 
excellent in the way everyone handled all the questions tonight. And we'll look forward to this uh, continued discussion. And again, to, to uh, reiterate Dennis's point, uh, the record is open until Wednesday, April 17th. We want to hear from the public. Anybody who has any input, we want to hear it. Um, send an email to cityhall at gaithersburgmd.gov. And um, I will note that the next regular meeting of the Mayor and Council is next week, uh, uh, Monday, April 15th. Um, tax day. Yes, tax day. Um, so um, thank you all. Um, and as always, let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned. Along with the fun I can have, I wear many hats, anything from general programming to playing video games or pool, talking with parents, helping with field trips.